Fun Time program. I'm your host, Vivica Volt, and this is my lovely co-host, John Andrew Fredrickson. And today we have a very special guest, Olivia Gray, who is a PhD candidate at U Chicago in human genetics. What's going on, Olivia? Hello. I'm so excited to see this in person. I've heard you do the intro a bunch of times now, and this is much more fun. <laughs> yes. Love it. Well, I'm glad that you actually like listen to and or watch our podcast before coming on instead of just being like, who are these people? <laughs> we should also point out why this is so exciting because I always listen to it in lab. And so now I get to see you on the actual couch instead of just like the picture that comes up in the little icon. Well, next time we're going to have to get you in here on the chair in Brooklyn. Uh, once this COVID nonsense is over, we really look forward to that. It's been too long since you've left New York and moved to Chicago and abandoned us. I know. As I, as I was going to point out, Olivia is a great friend of both of ours going mm-hmm. way back and has abandoned us to Chicago to study human genetics and Which do important things in the world. We accept because, I mean, obviously you're doing big things and you're getting your PhD. So like, fine. But we miss you. But tell us about COVID. I, I mean, this year has been the weirdest year for everybody. You have had one of the uh, more challenging stories that I think that I've heard because because you you run this lab where you have these live cell cultures that you're studying and you have to be keeping alive and going in every day. And then COVID hit and bam, it's like, h- how did you deal with that? Yeah. So, I mean, I should clarify, I don't I don't technically run my lab. My boss runs my lab, but I, I do. <laughs> well, the, you the you physically run the lab. <laughs> I physically do a lot of stuff in the lab. Yeah. And so. For us and for, I think, most universities, like, we had to shut down. I mean, universities are really, really aware, obviously, of, like, the scientific accuracy behind all of the dangers of COVID. So we weren't, you know, going to fuck around with those dangers. So we shut down pretty early. And when we did, like, everyone just had to leave. And obviously, if you work with live animals, live cells, anything like this, like, that's a problem for the type of research we do. So for me, you know, I had ongoing experiments that last, like, a month of time, and I just had to kill them. And that was mm. it. I just lose a month of work. And like, it sucks, you know, for me, because I'm trying to get a degree, but it, right. it is what it is. Um, I think a lot of people had it a lot worse. I got to keep my job. I got to keep, you know, I didn't go into True. lab. I wasn't going to get fired from being a PhD student. So it could have been wow. worse. Definitely. How has it been since things reopened in June? Has it kind of been st- kind of steady and, and you've been able to continue to get in every day and get the work done that you need to get done? Yeah, actually, I think I would say that my work experience has been safer than probably anything else I do. Um, I think like I've talked to my brother who works in sort of like a business sector that's not, you know, related to the sciences at all. And like the difference is sort of staggering. Like we like everything is so mapped out. There's like sanitizer bottles everywhere. You cannot be within like 20 feet of anyone. Everyone's masked. We have staggered shifts like it's super, super, super careful. Wow. And, and again, I think that speaks to the fact that like I'm next to one of the best hospitals in the nation, U Chicago Hospital, U Chicago Med. Like we are very aware of the risks and and right. you know, people don't really mess around with it. We also have like a weekly testing program, which I think should be implemented everywhere, but it's obviously hard to do that at scale. So I get tested by my university every week, get the results within 12 hours. Wow. So I know that the people I'm working around are safe. Which right. I think most people don't have that privilege. Like it's incredibly lucky to be where I am right now. Yeah, for sure. How has it been? Um, so like, what is it exactly that you're doing in the lab? Like, are you like, I know you like do something really cool with heart cells, but like, do you want to tell us more about what that is? Yeah. So, I mean, I wish I could tell you something super cool. Like I study COVID and I'm going to tell you how to fucking cure it, but I don't do that. <laughs> I study study what we call basic science, which is to say I ask questions that don't have any direct relevance to human health necessarily, but I'm trying to understand something on a more basic level about how some process in science works. And, you know, eventually that might translate to some health effects. But um, for me, I study human evolution um, and specifically I study Tibetans. So I study how people have adapted and evolved over time to deal with low oxygen. Um, which you can obviously apply to human diseases like asthma, like cancer, like you know, various cardiovascular diseases. Um, or even COVID. Low oxygen is a big problem with COVID, isn't it? Yeah. There, and there's been some like random reports that Tibetans either get more or less COVID, but there's very little data from that part of the world. So it's yeah. like, hard to say much. Um, yeah. But so what I do with heart cells, which is super, super fun, is I get to make what are called induced pluripotent stem cells. And so you've probably heard of stem cells from, you know, 
a lot of political stuff from a few, like a decade ago, back when politics was sort of fun and silly and not terrifying and awful. <laughs> the only thing I know about stem cells is that you have to kill and eat babies to create them. Exactly. Is that accurate? That, that was the big scandal, right? From when politics was simpler. <laughs> um, yes. No, no. Um, so yes, in the U.S., you cannot really do research that's that's publicly funded with with um, stem cells that are derived from embryos. Um, and even if you could, it, it's not super useful because you don't obviously get a ton of cells out of an embryo because they're very small. <laughs> you know, we would like to have a right. lot of cells to work with and study. And we'd like to get them from populations that we're interested in. So if you study disease, you want to have stem cells from people that have heart disease or have cancer right. or Down syndrome or whatever it is. And so what was a big innovation in the last couple of decades is that people learned that they could take adult cells, like blood cells, something that we all have tons and tons and tons of, sure. and we could reprogram them to become stem cell-like again. So they become this- Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, this sort of like, you know, embryonic type cell that can then go off into different cell fates. So you take a blood cell, you bring it back to like baby cell, and then it can become, say, a heart cell or a lung cell or a neuronal cell or anything like that. Wow. Um, heart cells are the most fun ones to create because you you reprogram them. It takes about a month. You tell them, I want you to become a heart cell. And about a week, a week and a half into this process, they start contracting in the dish. And you can you can almost see it, depending on how much they're contracting, you can see it with you know the naked eye or you can see it under a microscope. And it's it's still like, it feels like mad science. Like I, I feel like a kid when I look at it, I get so excited. It's so fucking cool. You are a mad scientist. I mean, I you're our favorite mad scientist, so. <laughs> <laughs> so what exactly are you studying with, with heart cells in, in the Tibetan population? And so, how does it relate to, um, uh, what's the word, uh, evolution? <laughs> Yeah, that, that one word. Um, that yeah. one word. <laughs> so, so with the heart cells, um, what I'm looking at, so you can imagine with you, when you adapt to live with low oxygen, there's going to be a number of different like cells or tissues or, or different organs or whatever in your body that, that might adapt differently to that. Obviously, humans are made up of a bunch of different cells. They all have the same DNA, but they all do different things. You know, your heart cell is different from your lung cell is different from your skin cell. Um, and so from what we understand, probably some of the cell types to be targeted by evolution are going to be cardiovascular cell types, things like your, your blood, your heart, your lungs, things that are obviously involved in the response to low oxygen. Um, and so what we can do is we can take Tibetan cells and we can take cells of a population that are closely related to Tibetans, but have never lived at high altitude. So like for us, we use Chinese samples. And that's a control group essentially, right? And so then you look at those, you make them into heart cells or you make them into endothelial cells, which are cells that are, are very prevalent in the lungs. And, and then you put them into low oxygen. So this is called sort of like an in vitro experiment. You put these cells into low oxygen and you look at how they respond to that in whatever way you wanna look at it. And you try to see what are the differences between how the Tibetan cells respond and how the Chinese cells respond. And you can learn something from that about how they've evolved to deal with this low oxygen stress. So I have this, this amazing box in my lab where we can simulate 1% oxygen concentration. It's like a glove box. It looks like I'm in like a sci-fi movie. It's fantastic. <laughs> and we'll just put these cells in there for like one day, two days, seven days, however long. And then and what do you see? That is a great question, John. I have just gotten all of that data back and I've been spending the last several days trying to dig through the analysis. And so I can't <laughs> tell you that yet. Um, Wonderful. Do you have any theories? Do you have any ideas of what you're kind of looking for? Yeah. I, th I mean, we, we know at least one gene that's definitely involved. I think what I expect to see is that, that Tibetans have evolved in a way to sort of dampen the response to hypoxia, which is to say like your body sort of freaks out when it's, it's stressed out by something, hypoxia being a sort of a big stressor on a lot of cell types. Hypoxia meaning low oxygen. Hypoxia meaning low oxygen, exactly. Um, and, and in this case, you have to sort of calibrate what that means, right? Because most of the cells in our body are not actually at atmospheric oxygen. Like your lung cells, you breathe in air, so they get 20% oxygen, but like your heart cells are not getting 20% oxygen. It sort of dilutes out as you go through your body. So when I say hypoxia, what I really mean is like 1% oxygen. Um, okay. And so, so what we think is that the body reacts to hypoxia in a way that is sort of a stress response. And sometimes what happens when we respond to stress is that we sort of over respond. There's sort of mm. like a huge increase in these sort of stress response genes that are trying to cope with that. 
Um, and that's good, but sometimes that like plasticity is too much and, and it, can, it can lead to downstream problems. Like a lot of people will get things like chronic mountain sickness if you go up into high altitude and it'll stress out your heart and you can have heart failure and all these bad things. Oh, these are chronic problems that people can have. I didn't realize that. I always thought it was kind of like short term and then your body adjusts. There are also short term problems that people can get immediately. Um, but mm. people who live at high altitude who were not adapted to live there, like if you compare Chinese lowlanders who moved to high altitude and they've lived there for like a generation or for like 50 years or however long. If you compare those people to Tibetans, they still are doing worse in terms of things like mm. you know, survival of offspring, in terms of birth weight of babies, sort of wow. classical markers of sort of evolutionary strategy, right? So like Tibetans are just doing better in the same conditions as adapted lowlanders. Do we already know that there's some genetic difference that is contributing to that? Or is that what you're trying to establish? No, we already know that there are genetic differences. Um, and that's something that's been pretty easy for us to map sort of computationally ever since we've been able to sequence the human genome, which is again, like a pretty recent phenomenon, but we know that there are differences. Right. Um, but the thing is that, that people don't think about a lot of times is that most of the genome doesn't code for a protein. Like the way that I think most of us are taught basic genetics is you have a gene and it gets transcribed into RNA and that RNA becomes a protein and that's how genetics works. 98% of your genome does not code for a protein. 98% of it is what they used to call junk DNA. And I was taught that, I don't know if you were taught that, that's not real. Like junk DNA mm. is, yeah. it does a lot of stuff. And so the problem is when you map a lot of these and you try to figure out where do we see signals of sort of selection in the Tibetan genome, a lot of that maps to areas that don't code for anything. And so interpreting that becomes a lot more of like a solving of mystery than like, oh, this makes sense. It changed this gene. Like, of course, they don't make this anymore. Hmm. Right. So the, the so best way it was ever described to me is, is I had a professor tell me that what we try to do with the non-coding DNA is it's like we're trying to find a light switch to a room. But the problem is if you were to walk into anyone's bedroom and you wanted to find the light switch, you'd like look in like three places. You'd like feel along the inside of the door. Yeah. It's like, it's probably there. If it's not there, maybe it's like, a, like along the other wall. And if like they have a really fucked up house, maybe it's like outside of the door. Right, so, right. <laughs> but with genetics, what it is, is it's like the light switch to this room might be in the bathroom of a house five blocks away. Wow. And so like our challenge is trying to figure out how to find that fucking light switch. So. It's what fun. is your process like? for there trying are, to find that light switch. Yeah, there are a lot of ways. Um, one of the common ways that people do, well, there's a couple common ways. One is you can look for sort of like statistical correlations between having a particular base in your genome, like an A, C, T, whatever, at this area, and then having a certain expression level of a given gene. So you just do a bunch of pairwise correlations um, another way people do it that's a lot more like direct and easy to think about is that they look at how genomes are looped. So you can think mm -hmm. of it like DNA is like string, right? And, right? and when it's inside of a cell, it's sort of all balled up. It's not like it's just like a big long thing. We always sort of depict it as this big long thing, but it's never actually linear. It's just in a ball. And right. what we found out in like the past decade is that ball is not just like a random crumpled ball. It's very meaningful. So hmm. we can imagine if you have like, I wish I had a piece of string. If you have a piece of string, you can imagine that like point A and point B could be very far apart if you look at it linearly. And you'd be like, well, they mm -hmm. interact with each other. They're like ages apart. But if that string is bent, A and B could actually be sitting right next to each other. And, and they can interact gotcha. across that across that spectrum. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so if you can wow. map where those bends are and where things get close together, you can understand that A and B actually are right next to each other all the time in this particular cell type or that particular cell type. And, and that's meaningful. And that's consistent across populations. This the, the the bending and whatever is not just random in different people. No, no. I mean, so there, there's certainly differences between cell types, um, but it, across populations, I think it's pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. Dope. Interesting. So, mm. like, what got you into genetics? Was that like your first choice, or did like were you thinking about doing something else? Or, uh, well, I mean, you guys knew me in college, so. <laughs> oh yeah. Was not my first choice. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, don't know if I had a first choice. Uh, let's see, what was I doing in college? The fact that I'm here is such a bizarre series of events. I really don't know where to start with it. Uh, start at the beginning. 
see. Okay. <laughs> I went to like a, a kind of like a eh, public school, got into NYU, which is very exciting because I've always wanted to go to New York. So I went to NYU. I was initially a chemistry major and decided pretty quick I didn't want to be a chemistry major. And let's see, then I briefly dropped out of college to go live with my tattoo artist boyfriend at the time and our pet pit bull, because you got to have that <laughs> in your life. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> needs that that diversion, that short diversion, right? You just got to take a little break and live with your uh, tattoo boyfriend. <laughs> Listen, everyone needs a small break. Um, and then I came back. and I, So when I dropped out briefly, I got really bored of not being in school because I'm a fucking nerd. So I went to like a local <laughs> junior college in between like working at a coffee shop to support us. And uh, I really fell in love with anthropology uh, just at this like little junior college. And so when I went back to NYU, I switched my major to anthropology and I did that, which again, definitively not genetics. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, not quite the same thing, no. But still the study of peoples. It is a study yes. of peoples. And, you know, and not all genetics is and not all anthropology is, but the part of anthropology right we cared about was was study of human populations and human diversity um and that and then i ended up sort of falling into a molecular anthropology lab um and molecular anthropology is is sort of it is essentially human genetics it's just a little bit they tend to ask different questions and they tend to focus more on non-human primates um which genetics has not done as much although those lines are blurring a lot i think now I see. Uh, but truth be told, I joined the molecular anthropology lab because I heard they all went out to have really fun bar nights once in a while. So, oh my god, yes. <laughs> that was also Honestly, a- that's a great reason. <laughs> that is the best answer. <laughs> I mean, it seems like it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, well, I wasn't even planning to apply to grad school, really. And then at some point, I was getting towards the end of college, and I didn't really know what I was going to do. And my advisor was like, you know, if you stay and go to grad school, uh, they will pay you money to go to school. And I was like, sick i don't have to make nice. choices for a few more years perfect nice and that's that's when you decided to go into a phd program specifically because masters obviously is is very different it's yes masters you do not get paid you pay them right right um and in a lot of countries you do have to do a master's first but the u.s has sort of a, an odd phd system in which our phds are always like four five plus years um, and they sort of include a sort of inbuilt masters where you do like a year or two of classes first and then you do research. Mm. Oh, that's so you cool. Not have a master's to go into a PhD program. Dope. Yeah. I that's primarily applied to, to, you know, anthropology programs, but then I looked at yeah. you and they're like, we have a human genetic specific program. And I was like, oh, Chicago, oh, that's, that's cool. fun. And I didn't and re- had you. So. Had you ever actually been to Chicago before you went to U Chicago? <laughs> yes, I had once, and it was uh, because I got into Northwestern for undergrad, and I toured Northwestern, and I never toured NYU. But after my tour of Northwestern, I was like, "Well, I'm going to NYU." <laughs> it was, I had a I'm sure experience. Northwestern is great. It was the worst college tour I have ever been on. <laughs> wow. Somebody's looking up your tour guide right now and firing them. I'm sure they're not still the tour <laughs> guide. God, I don't remember her name. <laughs> oh my God. That's fucking hilarious. Well, so she told you- me nobody ever went into Chicago. She told me that it was just Evanston was the best place to be in and I wanted to be in a city. And then she right. also yeah. joined a sorority and I was like, I'm not having that. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not going to pay to have friends. Sorry. Thanks. I think New York worked out pretty well for you. What? I mean, we liked having you here. I said I think New York worked out pretty well for you. I'm yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. It was a little stressful <laughs> at first, but then I met y'all. I mean, yeah. New York is always stressful. That's that's the standard. So what has Chicago been like? I mean, you you've been pretty busy, obviously, with your with your PhD program and but have you still been able to kind of get out and enjoy the city and meet people there and, and experience life in Chicago? Or has it been you've just been like buried in campus? Uh, well, I mean, not lately. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a pandemic on. Well, I mean, obviously this year, but you've been there how many years now? I have not gotten to enjoy Chicago much lately. Um, I did get around a bit more earlier on because the first year of PhD is just going to classes. And that's something I'm more Mm -hmm. familiar with and more familiar with sort of screwing around and being like, I'll be out all night and go to class in the morning. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I got into like proper research. I didn't get out as much as I would like to, but Mm. How do you enjoy the proper research? Is is that something you see yourself continuing to do after your 
PhD program is over? Yeah, I think, I mean, I would like to work with more people, I think. So the thing about stem cells is they require a lot of attention. And so right. I, apart from the pandemic shutdown, I've more or less worked seven days a week for the past two plus years. That's right. Talk to us about your schedule because you have the most insane schedule I've ever heard of anybody. Well, right now I don't. Right now I'm trying to write a thesis, so I don't have an right. insane schedule. But, but before, before that, that, like I was always working seven days a week. Not always for like full full days every of the seven days, but the thing is like you always have to be there in the morning to feed the cells, to check on the cells, to split the cells. And that's just like this pressure of knowing that that has to happen is so sad. Like if you're out with your friends, you're like, okay, but I have to get up at seven tomorrow and do this. Wow, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's worse it than having a dog. It weighs on you after a while to not have like one day to just sort of- bring- Right. Is that normal that most programs don't have multiple people managing things on different days? No. I, so the thing about PhD programs is I think it's very hard to categorize them into to normal or not. Um, to anyone mm. who is listening who is considering a PhD program, definitely talk to the people in the lab that you're considering joining because it, it will huh. vary dramatically. Um, I've heard different things about big labs and small labs. I'm obviously in a small lab and that has some advantages um, and some disadvantages. Big labs can be really sad too because you can get lost in the shuffle. Um, mm. Gotcha. I don't, I mean, I'm also working on a weird project. Like not everyone has to go in seven days a week to deal with stem cells. Like that's just got you. Like that's just a you thing. That's just a me thing. Yes. None what of other advice would, I was, no, I was just, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I was going to ask what other advice would you give your, you know, yourself or people, you know, who are looking into PhD programs? I think that's a really interesting perspective. It's like, you know, you want to talk to the people in the program and find out what their schedules are like, what kind of work they're doing, that kind of stuff. But like, what other advice would you give to people who are looking to, to join a program? That's good. I mean, yeah, I've been involved in a lot of recruitment, so I've actually had to give this advice a lot. I, <laughs> I think there's a lot of people who said, for one thing is don't ever talk to people like me. Don't talk to fifth or sixth <laughs> grad students because we're all cynical and sad at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so who do you talk, talk to? to? Like the second or third years who have like been through it a bit, but like they're still excited. <laughs> Okay. We're all just <laughs> and angry, so don't, don't ever listen to what we say. That's my first piece of advice, so take the second bit with grains of salt. Um, but I guess what I would say is, is in the sciences, at least we don't get forced into joining a lab right away. We get to like rotate through a couple of labs cool. to what we like to. And I would say if you have that opportunity, sort of explore, because I mean, not everyone comes from as weird of a background as I do coming into this, but you don't necessarily know what you want coming out of college. I'm not trying to talk down to you Zoomers. I think you're amazing, but you don't know what you want coming out of college. <laughs> I don't know what I want and I'm almost 30. So explore widely, you know, if you can take classes that are not in your field, like because I study Tibetans, I, I convinced my boss that it'd be a good idea for me to take like a, a history of art and culture in Tibet class. And that huh. was awesome. Okay. Right? Like don't don't people in in PhD programs I think get extremely zeroed in to like a very very specific topic that's sort of the nature of it, yeah. And like don't lose sight of the rest of everything. Like that's not your whole goddamn life. This one. Tiny yeah. Sometimes time. zoom out a little bit. Yeah, I think it's very healthy to try to zoom out a little bit. Mm. Are you able to do that, especially now that you've you've transitioned to this uh, latter period of your? Um, candidacy where you're focusing on your thesis. Do you feel that you're doing a little bit more uh, big picture work as a result of that? Because you're not just in doing the day, like doing the actual research every day. I don't, I think, I think not, I would say actually, because right now what I'm trying to do is write about the research, which actually makes me have mm. to think about it a lot more than when I was doing it. Because when I was <laughs> doing it, I got very used to it. Like I do a lot of bench work, you know, instead of just doing purely computational analysis type of work. So I do a lot of stuff where I'm just in like a cell culture hood or like pipetting things or, you know, the way that people picture what scientists do, you know, just like right. what's right. That doesn't always require a ton of brain space, especially if you've done it forever. So that was actually when I would do things like listen to your podcast or like listen to like outside world news or like learn nice. Uh, now I obviously can't listen to podcasts while trying to write a thesis. So now I think yeah, I'm actually going to have to actually think program. about stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I know that feeling. That's interesting. But is it at least a little bit more big picture in the sense that you're kind of starting to tie things together or, or are you still too early in that process of writing the thesis? Oh, that's a good point. I think I'm still slightly too early. Like, cause eventually I'll have to write like the introduction to the whole thing and like try to do right. all the, right now I'm writing sort of the chapters, which are like the, the individual like bits of it. 
um yeah i think i will have a bigger picture view towards the end of it but that is so scary to think about right now like wow. <laughs> go into the chicago winter and just like lock myself in ice and just, oh like, my goodness <laughs> oh my goodness that just is like tough. your fortress of solitude chicago? what's that do you want to come visit chicago i'm going to be real lonely i mean if this pandemic ever chills out it's just getting worse and worse it's it's I, nuts oh, no don't tell me about it illinois i think is probably the worst state right now it, yeah, it's yeah, awful. Yeah, I was gonna say there. if it was like easy for us to travel there in like a safe capacity, absolutely. But like the oh, safest way God. for us to travel there would be to drive, and that's like what, like a fifteen, <laughs> yeah, some hour, twenty drive? something like that. Yeah, it's nuts. I just finished a two week quarantine because somebody that I was working with uh, per- tested positive for COVID and and identified me as somebody who had been in close contact. So I started getting calls every day from New York State checking up on me, and they offered me a hotel, and they were gonna like feed oh, me and everything, and. New York, New York City is doing a great job with it, but it, it's, it's just very invasive. You know, it's like. That's also, it seems like it's also only through work that they do the contact tracing. Because- no, if, when you test positive, they immediately ask you, who have you been in close contact with? Oh, okay. Um, and you have to identify people and, and whoever you identify, then they start following up with those people. I have heard though, that you can just ignore them. I didn't choose to do that route because I was kind of curious about the process, Um but it's good to see that the state is, is, or the city at least, is is really making an effort to make people feel like this is serious and also we're here to help. So they offer you a hotel. They offer to have like meal services for you. Um, there's even some program where if like you're not able to... Uh, you're not able to work because you're quarantined that they can help you financially. So it's cool to see that they're making that effort. I don't know what it's like in the rest of the country, but the point for me though, is like, it's just, it's really, it, it sucks. You know, like we're, we're trying to get stuff done. We're trying to go about our lives. And, and if you want to travel and go someplace like Chicago or whatever, the quarantine situation is also just really annoying. Like you got to spend two weeks in quarantine before you can see anybody. Yeah. I was definitely worried coming out here because I haven't, I haven't been out to Philly to see my family in uh, over a year now. Uh, and it was just mm-hmm. getting worse. And we're like, well, it's now or never. Cause like I get tested every week. So now it's sort of the best time for me to be able to go and see them in a safe capacity. Right. right. I, the whole time leading up to my flight, I was like, is Illinois going to get put on like the naughty list for Pennsylvania? Where like, I have to go here in quarantine for two weeks. Cause if that happens, I have to cancel my trip. Cause it's a four right. day trip. Like I can't quarantine. Right. For- uh, yeah. Right. How's your father doing? Because he works in a hospital in, in Philly, right? And you were telling me during the height of this at the beginning, it was like really crazy and scary and dangerous. And and I'm sure that cooled off for a bit, but now things are picking up again, right? Yeah, he works in a hospital actually across the river in Jersey. Um, mm. I, think, I think for legal reasons, I'm not allowed to say which one. I'm, okay. I've heard it, but, um, but yeah, it, I mean, it was really scary at the beginning, the same as, as in many hospitals. I think the story that you heard everywhere was just sort of like, you know, all of the PPE was getting rationed, you know, he had one N95 a week sort of a deal. Um, right. And it was sort of like swapping out surgical masks on top of the N95, which is just sort of terrifying to think about. Right. Mm. Uh, and it got better. Like it never really got overwhelmed in this part of, of the country as the way it did in New York um, or even in parts of Chicago. Um But he's definitely noticed an uptick. Like he really didn't have COVID cases for a long time in sort of the dip. And now apparently it's sort of like halfway to capacity again. Is he working with COVID patients now? Yeah. So he's an anesthesiologist. um, And so. Oh, right. Oh, God. Um, But But they they were getting anesthesiologists were getting some of the worst um, like exposure. Right. Because they were the ones intubating everybody, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, your yeah, your job is definitely intubation, and so he and luckily, like what they have there, which is is reusable, is some sort of I don't exactly know what it's called, but it, it basically it's like this, it's like a half of a spacesuit, it's like a hood that goes over your head that has its own sort of like vacuum um, air supply and stuff like this. So mm. he's actually fairly well protected for the intubations themselves, um, and I think oh really possible. okay anyone who comes into the hospital is COVID tested, which is good. But, but the COVID scary, patients like the cases are climbing again and we're watching everything in Europe go into second rounds of shutdowns. And yeah, <laughs> and and we never really up. quite got out of first round of shutdown here. Right. No, seriously. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of expecting it to happen to us next. Yeah, I think so too. You have the uh, fortunate, um, uh, perspective of being close to other scientists who work in virology and who may know so- a thing or two about vac- vaccines and how that process goes. Uh, I know Pfizer today announced that they have uh, 
received results. I think they're saying something like 90% effective, the yeah. vaccine that they're working on, um, which of course has everybody really excited. But what, what does that, that actually mean in terms of like timeline, in terms of process? Like, are we, are we looking at still months away here? Do you, do you know how that works? So from what I understood, and this is not talking so much to the scientists, I know, because at this point, it, you know, the vaccine is developed, right? It's sort of about the distribution part. But talking to, you know, like my dad and other doctors, that my understanding is that by the end of the year, the number of, of vaccines they could produce is really not enough that anyone could be expected to get vaccinated, I don't think. Like the number, you know, wouldn't even cover if, because they're not going to all go to the US, obviously. Right. Um, they're going to be distributed and the people who are going to get them first are going to be ideally the the sort of the first response workers and people like right. that. Right. Workers. So the odds of any of us getting a vaccine in, the, in this year outside of a vaccine trial, which I've signed up for, because hopefully that'll work out. Really? How did you, how do you sign up for a vaccine trial? Uh, my university circulated emails. They're doing one. I think probably most major universities are doing them. Um, wow. I haven't gotten contacted yet, but I, I signed up. So I'm hoping. So you're not afraid that Bill Gates is going to microchip you with this vaccine? No, oh, Bill Gates can microchip me all he wants. I don't care. <laughs> so you're one of them. Oh my goodness. No, but th so th this is actually a real issue though. The, the whole, uh, I've already known quite a few people that are kind of in the anti-vaccination crowd, but I'm getting the impression that there are more people who are wary of this new vaccine because they're afraid that it's going to be pushed through too fast and it's not going to be fully tested and we're not going to know what the long-term effects are. And so therefore they'd rather wait for other people to get it and they're not going to vaccinate themselves. And it feels to me that that number is larger than the normal anti-vaccination crowd. Do you, do you think, first of all, is there any merit to those fears? And if not, how do we fight back against, against that fear? So, Okay. I mean, I don't think that I am qualified to say whether this is is more or less safe than vaccines that took years to finish. I also don't know that you can really make that claim because like the, the times we've pushed through vaccines either quickly or slowly before have been like so long ago and, and the field that I'm in, none of the things that I do in my lab on a day-to-day -day basis existed in 2007. Like right. science wow. has changed yeah. so quickly and so dramatically that I think it's really hard to be like, oh, well, like the fastest vaccine we pushed through before took like four years and it was in 1950. Like, I'm not correct about these numbers or dates, but sure, right. I, I don't know that you can make that extrapolation necessarily because the future, you know, from that perspective, is just so much different. And, right. and you know, the timelines now are going to be different because we have so much more interconnection between scientists and so much more money in, in everything and, and just different science. So I don't know is the answer if this is going to be you know better or worse because they push it through faster. What I do know is that they're doing so many trials and so many different things that they're you know I, I, the worst case scenario for me is that the vaccine works but is sort of like like an eh vaccine like it's not as effective as they say it is like it doesn't work great and you have to like go through and get a second round of vaccinations once they've sort of improved it. I think mm. you know. I, I guess I don't, I can't say anything about whether it's going to be terrible for you, but I really think that that's highly unlikely because they, they, most of the, the trials that they're able to do are going to be trials looking for like secondary side effects, right? Like those are the easy trials. Right. Those are the ethically simple trials. You just give a bunch of people the vaccine and see what happens. And if there are any bad side effects, those trials get shut down. We've already seen news of that. So I think the right. odds of like people freaking out and being like, oh, we're going to have a vaccine that's going to like cause all these crazy side effects. It's going to be awful are really low. I think the bigger risk is that we have a vaccine that's like less effective because estimating efficacy is hard unless you're doing human trials of like that or challenges with COVID, which is right. not always easy which to do. I know they're doing that in London, but I don't know that they can do that ethically everywhere. It depends on like the laws of the individual places. Mm. Right. So I would be first in line to get the vaccine is the short answer to your question. Interesting. I, I would absolutely. Well, I think that that says a lot, you know, as somebody who, you know, you work in the sciences, you kind of understand how these things work behind the scenes. You have confidence in the process. You have confidence in the people doing it. You have so much confidence in it that you would be first in line to get the vaccine. And I think that that says a lot because the people who don't have confidence are the ones who seem to have the least actual uh, knowledge and exposure to how this works. If, if that's, yeah. is that fair to say? <laughs> probably fair to say. I mean, I have confidence in the redundancy of the process. The science where you're most likely to have like like false claims perpetuate in is the science that doesn't get 
repeated. Like the scientific process is you test, you repeat, other people test and try to repeat re your results. If you're studying some obscure thing about like how clams evolved in the South China Sea, like, okay, maybe you could perpetuate false claims because not enough people are studying that. But everyone, the global eyes are focused on this. Right. You right. know, like, people are repeating experiments on experiments. Like this is one of the best studied things there is. So yeah, I, I would say with my knowledge of the inside of science, I would, you know, absolutely line up to get the vaccine first. Well, I'm convinced that that's good to hear. Not that I was unconvinced before, but it's nice to hear, you know, it's nice to hear your perspective on that and hear your confidence in it, knowing, you know, what you know and where you work and, and your proximity to the, the kind of people who are doing this work and your understanding of it. So I, I think that that story needs to be told, you know, more people need to hear that story. So we're going to, well, we're going to be putting that one out on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, you better pass that on to your anti-vaxxer friends because I don't know any, but it sounds like well, you've talked to a few. I have, I have exactly one anti-vaxxer friend and uh, she currently lives in the United Arab Emirates and I did not expect her to be an anti-vaxxer at all. And like the way she started talking about it, I was like, okay, so you're worried about it, about getting micro tripped. All right. But like, let's talk about your social media really quick. Cause you're on <laughs> Snapchat every fucking day. You're on Facebook all the time. You're yeah. on Twitter. Like you realize that if anyone wanted to follow you around, you have a phone in your pocket, yeah. right? Like yeah. it's, it's so bizarre. It doesn't make any sense. And you start engaging with people in these conversations and you realize it's just, they're, they're creating these elaborate stories and then just like buying into them and not actually like critically thinking about, do they add up and do they make sense cohesively? And, you know, it's hard to have real conversations with people when cohesiveness in their, in their stories about the world isn't a, ne a necessity for them. Okay. So like in your study with genetics, have you had the opportunity to work with CRISPR or like, what do you know about it? Yep. I would say probably almost everyone who works with genetic now has worked with CRISPR at one point or another. So I have like actually worked with it. It's not just something that you're aware of. You've actually like, Oh no. Uh, yes, been hands on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have deleted what? a region of the genome from uh, sets of human cell lines. I've also deleted a region of the genome from a bunch of mice that I made. So Dope. that's fun. What, at what point in the process are you deleting the genome or, or parts of the genome? Is that, is that accurate? The way I phrased oh, it? No, parts of okay. the So CRISPR, CRISPR does a couple of things. You, I mean, you can think of CRISPR as a pair of scissors, right? Which I'm sure you've heard before. Um, and so you can do a number of things with that, right? Either you can make like a single cut in DNA. And if you do that in the middle or like the start ideally of a gene, the DNA will try to repair itself. When DNA tries to repair itself with two blunt ends, it can sort of make mistakes a lot of the time and you'll end up with sort of like a tiny insertion or deletion. That can screw up a gene, screw up the transcription of a gene. So you can like turn a gene on or off by making a single cut. That's hugely convenient. Other mm -hmm. things you can do are delete regions by making two cuts on two different sides of something you want to get rid of. And then mm -hmm. still another thing you can do is try to add new things by making a cut, but then adding a secondary template that you want to insert into the cut. So when the DNA tries to repair, it copies off of that new template. Where does this template come from? You you also add that to the mix. So it's pretty easy to generate small bits of DNA that, that have whatever code you happen to want into it. If it's not too long, it's actually like, I could order something today online for like $4 for <laughs> like a hundred base pairs of just DNA. It's very easy what? to send. I mean, and this is part of the reason why CRISPR is so powerful because you really just need like small oligos of RNA to target specific parts of the genome. So you can like order these bits of RNA for very, very little money. And it's very easy and quick to make. And using just that, you can target sort of anywhere you want based on the code that's in that RNA. So you're making edits to specific cells? I'm making edits yeah. to the genomes of specific cells. Then what I have to do if I want to have sort of a pure population. So you can imagine I basically dump a bunch of CRISPR into these cells, for example. And some of the cells are going to get edited. Some of them aren't. Every cell obviously has two copies of DNA. So in some cells, you'll only edit one of them. In some cells, you'll get lucky and edit both of them. In some cells, you'll edit none of them. Um, and then what you do is you single cell sort it, which means that every individual cell goes into a different well of a big plate of, of you know, a bunch of little holes, essentially. And then those mm -hmm. single cells will start to divide, divide, divide. And eventually, uh -huh. you have cells that came from one cell. So if you wanted to have a large organism that had these edits, at what point in the reproductive cycle of that organism would you need to make these edits? At the level of, of an egg, essentially, or a zygote. Okay. Things from early cycle, yeah. So you'd be editing the cells within an egg? 
Yeah. So I, so for animals, I don't do that. You Chicago and most mm. other places for these really complex things will have sort of a core of people who are, are a professionals in doing exactly this, but also have like the really complex equipment. So for cells, I can sort of simply like make a mix of media and put it on top of the cells and it has chemicals in it that, that push the CRISPR into the cells for mm. using a single mouse zygote. You need this like crazy machine where you can like micro inject into the egg, the bits of, you know, so I, that's something that most wow. labs don't have because it's a multi-million yeah. dollar piece of equipment. Um, so that part I didn't, do. I wish I did. I'm not that cool. So you could be using CRISPR then to create different mouse populations that have different uh, DNA modifications to them. Oh yeah. And people do. I mean, we have people multiple mouse cores at U Chicago and almost all of them have been edited in one way or another. Wow. Wow. Cause previously you would have to create mouse populations by selectively breeding, right? Yeah. So, I mean, mice and, and, and model organisms are interesting because they've actually, because they've been model organisms for so long, there's actually a lot of very creative ways of modifying them without having to like select for some random thing for like thousands of generations. So like Mice, you could sort of randomly target things into the genome that you can cause to recombine. And this is going to be more genetically complex than I can explain very quickly. But basically, because mice have been a model organism for so long, people have mouse populations, basically, that you can buy a mouse that has a knockout of any gene in the entire genome. You can just buy it online. Because wow. so many labs have been working on this for so many years. And before we right. had CRISPR, it's not like you could just choose whatever you wanted to do. Like, so people right. would spend years and years generating these mouse populations that were super, super useful for people or had these specific elements where you could cause a piece of DNA to like remove itself from the genome or insert, you know, so mm -hmm. mice are a little different in that way, but, but the, you know, you could obviously never do that with cells because it wasn't that easy to like spend generations. You don't have generations of human cells. You can't breed human cells. Right. So. Do you see this having potential within the human population at some point? I mean, clearly people have already claimed to have done it. And and there have been studies where people have done sort of theoretical ideas of CRISPR where like they're not government funded so they can use human embryos and things like this. And you, you can do it. Um, I think that you could use CRISPR. There, I mean, there have been also ways of people talking about using CRISPR in adult populations. Like there have been, I think, HIV or AIDS treatment studies that involved removing like blood cells and performing CRISPR in those and then re um, reputting them back into the, the host. Um, so yeah, I see it being practically useful in the human population. Hmm. I, I don't know that it's there yet. And I don't know that we would expect to see like highly edited CRISPR babies anytime soon because there's just too much room for error. You need a lot of things that don't work to have the things that do work. It's not like it's a perfect thing. Like every single time you put it in any cell, it's always going to do exactly this. Got you. So you don't see us uh, getting too close to Gattaca anytime soon. No. And mostly because like the things that people thought were going to happen when we imagined a Gattaca world are like just too hard to change. Like most mm. Traits are, are really highly polygenic, which means they involve a bunch of different genes. And so unless mm. you're going to go around CRISPRing like, you know, dozens and dozens of genes to change somebody's like small pinky size or something like it's, it's you know, it's ridiculous. Are yeah. you familiar with the flatworm? Hmm? Are you familiar with the flatworm? The elegance? I'm, I've never yeah. worked. But yeah, but but you know how they mapped out the the neural structure of of oh, the yeah. of the of the flower. We were just talking about this with the last podcast um, guest, and I think what's so interesting about that is that when you have a simple organism like that, you can kind of make these very specific changes or understand very specific things like this thing does that, this thing does that. But as you get up into more complex species and you eventually get to human beings, things just get so messy that that there is yeah. no simple individual edit where it's like boom, now this person is going to have this quality. You know what I mean? You can, there is no like being good at playing the violin gene. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and this gets into sort of the, I mean, it gets into sort of the idea of basic science and also the complexities and, and also problematic nature of studying human genetics. Like anyone who wants to figure out like, oh, how, how do we transcribe a gene from like a super mechanistic level? How does like the polymerase sit onto the gene and do the thing? You're not gonna do that in human cells. That would be insane. There's like tons of stuff going on. It's very hard to do a lot of things. People will use like yeast, like single celled organisms. And it's right. like, oh, people think, well, oh, how can that be a model for humans? But they're doing the same things, just sort of more, more simplistically with less moving parts. And like, 
that is a reasonable proxy to understand how things work. It's probably not going to be identical in, in humans, but it makes sense to study things more simply. And I, yeah, the flatworms, I think there's a woman at my university actually who studies this and has done some of the neural mapping. And that's fascinating because they only have a yeah. handful of neurons. You can do that. Right. Yeah, yeah, they've mapped the cool. they've mapped the entire neural structure of the flower. Yeah. That's what's so interesting. It's incredible. Um, if you can like alter specific parts of it and see what happens, you can't do that with a human. That's nuts. Right. Like, right. Right. I think the closest that we've come to mapping the human brain on any level that's like even vaguely close to the flatworm is that they took like I think they cut a human brain into like single cell like sheets. Nice cross um, sections. Yeah. And basically like went top down and created like hundreds of thousands of little like I want to say like either one cell or uh, like probably like one cell large sheets going across um, to like map the entire brain. But again, you're only their ability to do that was limited to one brain and right. that like they can study that one brain that way but that doesn't mean that it's going to function the same way as like the next three brains that they're able to do that with of course and again i mean then you're seeing it sort of from a structural level of here's what every single cell in this brain is doing but what is every protein in every cell of that brain doing like it just gets exactly. infinitely more complicated right so we're talking about like order of magnitude um uh progression in terms of complexity. Do you see uh, our progression in terms of our understanding of these things and our ability to ma manipulate these things? Is it also happening on an exponential curve to the point where eventually we could be talking about understanding the human genome well enough to make CRISPR edits to have babies that really just have all the qualities that we want and don't have any of the bad qualities that we want at some point in the next, I don't know, thousand years? Or, or is this really just like such a complex problem that you don't even foresee that happening? I don't know. I think that's really impossible to say because I, I think we're looking at an exponential curve from sort of the middle of it. And I, mm. I, I can't tell you, you can't make predictions about that when it's going to level off. Fair um, enough. I think a lot of the complexity though, is that, you know, for things where it's affected by a lot of different genes and things that's going to, that is something, the degree to which it's affected by different genes, the specific parts of different genes that affect things that can change from population to population. And one of the big problems that we have in genetics is that for a long time, and it's gotten a little bit better, but not a lot, all of our sort of base sample populations have been white Europeans. And that is right. just yeah. not representative of human diversity at all. Like it is- What are you, how, what do you mean? You mean we're not all white Europeans? I am shocked by this information. Absolutely no. shocked. <laughs> but even worse than that, like human European, like, if, okay, if Europeans were like one of the more diverse cultures on earth, I'd be like, okay, we're capturing a lot of it, but they're just not. They're bobblehead. <laughs> they're really like, not. <laughs> they came out of Africa, they went to Europe, it got cold, most of them died, and then they repopulated from a very small population. We're very bottlenecked. Humans are so similar to each other that we sort of take it for granted because we make up all these differences that we see between us. But like the difference between any two humans on the planet is so, so much less than like two chimpanzees across a river. Like it is shocking, mm. so genetically similar. And probably the reason for that is a lot of us died in the last ice age and we were forced to oh, wow. a very small number of people. When was that? Was that like 12,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, something like that? Oh, that is a good question. I haven't been in anthropology long enough, so I don't I don't want to make an estimate and then get it wrong. And mm. have That's fine. Back. My yeah. brief study, though, of, of, of human history in terms of like our exodus out of Africa is it's just so amazing how small the numbers of people were. You know, they're talking about like maybe a thousand people like we're all everybody who is of non-African descent today. Um, is descended from like the smallest tribe of maybe a thousand people that left Africa a hundred thousand years ago or something like that. It's nuts. Yeah. And then there's been some admixture over the years because there's been other exoduses, you know, there's been probably right. waves of population across different places. And we're just, I mean, we're starting to be able to map that complexity now too. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's true. Like humans, humans are really what we would call bottleneck population is so even even within Africa, which is the most diverse part of the human population, like it's still we every human on earth is just so genetically similar. And I think that's something that we forget a lot when we yeah. were all descended from Adam and Eve. Gross. You know, what's the, one of the most problematic things that they have in genetics is we've come up with two phrases, which I hate. We have mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. 
And the reason for this is that, as you probably know, both mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosomes can only pass from one sex. You only get your mitochondrial right. DNA from your mom. You only get a Y chromosome if you're a male from your father. And so there are these single lineage things. They make it very easy to trace. Like a lot of the early like population tracing was done this way. And so mm -hmm. theoretically, you can sort of trace back to like whatever the common ancestor of all mitochondria or all Y chromosomes is. So you can make predictions about when that person might have lived. So you can trace like all mitochondrial DNA in the whole world back to one woman who lived in Africa some number of years ago, and they call her mitochondrial Eve. <laughs> Wow. Incidentally, the predictions of age are radically different. Mitochondrial Eve and Adam did not live at the same time. So. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so what you're saying is women ruled the world for some time before men came along. Perfect. <laughs> I would love, love to, to hear that. I don't know if it went in that order, but I hope so. <laughs> That is so interesting. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, it, it's amazing how, we, when, when was the human genome first sequenced? It was in the nineties, right? Uh, no, no. The human genome, the first sequence of the human genome, I want to say, I, now I feel like I'm gonna have to look it up, but I want to say it was like 2003. It's pretty, right. okay. okay. I mean, cause it was a yeah. huge undertaking. The way that they were sequencing the human genome when they first did it was not the way that we sequence genomes now. They were not doing sort of what we call next gen sequencing where you can sort of sequence a bunch of stuff all at once. They were sort of sequencing mm -hmm. it bit by bit by bit, dozens and thousands of people across the world. Like it was huge. It was massive. You know, the, the cost yeah. of sequencing the first human genome is so much more than the cost of sequencing a hundred genomes now. Like, wow. that, and that's yeah. one thing that people talk about in terms of the exponential growth is like when, when we were first looking at the human genome project, it looked like something that was never going to finish. You know, when we were 5% of the way, the predictions were this is going to take another hundred years. And then all of a sudden it was finished in like 10 years or something because you have that exponential growth that enabled that to happen. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see if we're still experiencing that kind of growth in terms of, you know, our ability to continue advancing this research. Do you feel like there's, there are new techniques coming out every year that, that radically change your ability to do the kind of work that you do, or is it, are you still kind of working with the same tools that you were working with when you first started doing your research? Uh, I mean, it's a little bit hard to say, cause like once you get into a project, you're not going to start introducing new tools to like things you've been doing, but right. So computationally, I think absolutely there are new, so half of my program does sort of like theoretical statistics and computational stuff. So when, with human genetics, obviously, you know, the human genome is massive. When you sequence like millions of human genomes, you have like these massive, massive data sets, sort of the big data problem. And so there are people who, who study genetics who don't ever, you know, spend a day in a wet lab holding a pipette, but they come up with these incredible, brilliant ways to analyze the human genome and to deal with this massive, data because now we have all of these publicly available databases where you can just go and download, you know, 10,000 human genomes and you can do all of this research with something that's already out there that like most people can't do if you have those skills. Um, so I think in that area, there's probably still rapid growth that I am not, you know, intelligent enough or, or trained enough in that area to understand. Um, but even in, you know, like when I was just getting into grad school, CRISPR was just barely being talked about. I mean, CRISPR, I think, sort of became widespread starting around 2012, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And okay. I, I started grad school in 2015. So it, it was just becoming a thing that like, and, you know, after that I had to spread around and become commercialized, you had to be able to like buy it off of, you know. Right. So I was just hearing whispers about CRISPR and now I've done it, you know, multiple times myself and everyone I know has done it. So yeah, in my experience, like a lot of things have sort of come in in recent times. Wow, that's amazing. That's really fucking cool. Yeah, it's so a really like, cool area to be in. I mean, honestly, I could talk to you about genetics all day because, like, I just think that everything that you do with genetics is super fascinating and super fun. Whenever so, it's safe to come and visit, I'm just going to bring you into my lab and we'll just stare at heart cells and poke them and it'll be great. You yes. can poke them? I mean, you shouldn't, but you definitely could. You won't die. <laughs> <laughs> They might have a little bit of an issue with it, but like... They, they might die, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I actually have a really interesting question about genetics that's kind of been bugging me for a while. I hadn't thought about it before, but um, be one of the... Now, after that lead up. <laughs> right. What, one of the theoretical fears of um, uh, populating the, the galaxy is that we might run into um, biological organisms on other planets that are hostile to humans and 
that when you, I don't know, land on a planet, all of a sudden you get infected and it kills your whole population. How likely is it that something that has evolved independently from the life that we know on Earth uh, is able to in any way interact with our biology in a way that is damaging? Oh, God, I, I'm not equipped to answer this. I'm not a microbiologist. Uh, we, we've certainly okay. seen this in human populations, right? Like when uncontacted populations come into contact, and that's within the same right. species. And that's so, where the theory right. comes from. But but the problem with that is that, at least on Earth, all life on Earth has arisen from the same uh, general right. origin. And and I, it, theoretically, if you're bumping into life in other places in the galaxy, it would have uh, a, a separate origin, might be in no way related. Like, it, it, you know, who, who knows how different it could be? And I just wonder if, if do you need that similar... Is the DNA is like based off of the same basic thing on with life on Earth, and that enables you know viruses and and bacteria and stuff to invade our systems because they're somewhat related, or or is that not nece necessary? Well, I think at the at the very basic basic level, like you would have to imagine that whatever the life was we were contacting would have to be carbon based because you know right. it would presumably have to have DNA or RNA of some kind. I. Mm -hmm. I think that there are probably theories of, of how it could evolve differently and not have that. But I've heard silicone based is, is a possibility. Yeah. And I, I doubt that that would interact, but I'm not a chemist, so I don't know. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, theoretically, I, I mean, I think this is a huge question, right? Like how did life first arise on earth? Like, was it, I think a lot of people think that probably RNA was what came first and then, uh -huh you know, either reverse transcribed into DNA and then, you know, proteins and whatever came next. Um, and the question is like, would that always be the case? Is that the only way we can get life? Um, and, right. and I wish that I was like the, a cosmos type person and I could tell you this, but I don't know, but I think it's a really <laughs> fascinating question. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm hoping we can, we can discover an independent origin of life at some point in our lifetime. That would be that would that would be really cool. Doesn't kill us. That would be that would be good. That ideally doesn't kill us. Even better. Agreed. Preferably. <laughs> um, even if we maybe deserve it, I don't know. No, uh -huh. I refuse to believe that. I just watched the movie Life um, the other day with a few of my friends on Discord, and that's the one with uh, Ryan Reynolds and Jake Gyllenhaal and a couple other people where they um, encounter this Martian life form that was originally dormant and they were able to feed it like sugar and make it come back to life and Love then it. they electrocuted it and it fought back and then killed like the whole crew and mm -hmm. like eventually spoilers um was accidentally brought to earth and Shock. was very hostile to life um specifically humans because the humans on the space like the ISS or whatever had been very hostile towards it so it like like a baby learned how to react mm. and mimic and was like well if you're hostile I'm hostile so this is why we should be nice to our robots because they're only going to get more intelligent and they're going to remember when we were rude to them <laughs> I'll try my best I don't I don't so, have an or anything but i do have so okay. i mean like I speak have, speak nicely to your siri john i do i always do i'm very polite with siri you say please and thank you yes okay i have a little knockoff Roomba, and i put giant googly eyes on it and it's my pet so <laughs> nice fondly when the robot revolution happens what's its name its name is is robo bean robo that's adorable bean. i actually have a little like uh it's like a neato uh robo vacuum um and i named it rosie because like rosie from the oh, jetsons that's so cute <laughs> do you want giant um, googly eyes to put on it because i'm telling you it is a huge uptick <laughs> i love that you know i might but i actually haven't used it in a really long time because like the way that my apartment is laid out is it's very inconvenient for uh, Roomba, despite the fact that like 90% of our apartment is all carpeted and having it get into my roommate's room is like a whole situation. So I just ended up getting an upright vacuum and just hand like vacuuming manually. You, you could still put googly eyes on your vacuum. I, I could still it totally put googly It just like doesn't really move anymore. So. <laughs> oh my God. I love it. When I got the vacuum, I would just like follow it around with my camera being like, let me go. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck 
be like, amazing. Any kid who never has pets. <laughs> like, yeah. The robots are the coolest, man. I hope we get more and more access to cool robots in our lives. I'd love to talk to you more about the diversity issue, though. I mean, obviously, science has had a diversity issue from early on in the sense that, like, it's always been wealthy white men from the beginning who were advancing science. And uh, fortunately, more and more people have been able to get involved in doing science. But like you said, we still have problems with, you know, the the populations that we're doing research on are not even necessarily diverse enough in, in those kinds of issues. What has your experience been in your program specifically in terms of like, you know, being a young woman? Do you feel that you've been out of place in any capacity or that you're kind of like breaking through some barriers or working with, you know, people that aren't necessarily exposed to, I don't know, what, what's it been like? Well, before you answer that, I'm just going to go ahead and clarify. You don't necessarily identify as a woman, right? Ah. Uh, yeah. Well, so, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to take that mantle because I like to represent women people, but no, I do identify more as non-binary. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I'm but also, that's even better, you know, because it's like that's not something that people necessarily bump into every day. And and in, in the scientific community, what is what is your experience been with that? Well, the thing non-binary is, is exactly nailed no, because I changed my pronouns on Zoom and nobody said a word. <laughs> John didn't notice. I literally until just today. noticed tonight. <laughs> like I've um, noticed for quite some time, and I just thought it was really funny that like as you were coming in, uh, John was like, "She, they," and I'm like. Yeah. I, well, I was just surprised. I was like, how long has this been a thing? I didn't know. Um, no, I mean, so a few things, I mean, with your question, first of all, I mean, I, I am a woman in science, but I'm also a, a white woman presenting person in science. And I think that does make a difference and it's probably made my life a lot easier. I'm also mm. very privileged in the fact that I am in an all woman lab right now, which I think is, oh, wow. I mean, I mean, my lab is small, but it is me my boss who runs the lab, who is a woman and my technician who, who works for me and my boss and is also a woman. Um, and so like, I feel like at some point early on in grad school, I had a conversation with a few other women cause I'm in a lot of like queer women chat groups about grad school. Yeah. And we were talking about like, does your lab pass the Bechdel test? <laughs> <laughs> what is the Bechdel test? Oh, yeah. oh my God. I'm so excited for John to learn what the Bechdel test is. Do you want to tell him or should I? Oh, you, you tell him and I will follow up with my lab story. Okay. So the best shell test is, uh, when you have two women or female presenting people, um, speaking, this is usually like in a movie or a TV show. Um, how long can they speak before mentioning a man or how long can they go before, they are referring to a man in some capacity or referring back to a man in some capacity. Because if something is truly feminist, two women should be able to have a conversation without talking about a man. Um, but a lot of female characters are written in a way that they are based solely around one of their male characters. So they won't pass the Bechdel test. Hmm. So like the way that I've heard it described is basically in sort of any work of, of fiction, you know, you know, like you said, movie, TV show, book, whatever. Mm -hmm. it, it passes or does not pass the Bechdel test based on whether or not you have two specifically named female characters, they have to have names, that mm -hmm. have a conversation with each other without anyone else present about a topic that does not involve a man. And, and as it, there's like, there's like lists on the internet, like surprising numbers of things don't pass the Bechdel test. Like interesting meaning, well, meaning that essentially that, that women's role in fiction is often in some way related to a man. Yeah. Revolving yeah. around. Revolving around. Yeah. Like, I Even mean, for like strong female characters, you'll often find that like, oh, they actually have never had a conversation in this, in this, whatever it is, a book, whatever with anyone who's not a man or, or whatever it is. I mean, wow. like a perfect example is, um, for almost the entire time that Stephen Moffat was writing Doctor Who, um, none of the female characters actually passed the Bechdel test. So, like, there was, like, fucking six, seven, eight seasons of Doctor Who, of the new Doctor Who, where mm. it just did not pass the Bechdel test. And there were really strong female characters in the show, but they could not pass the Bechdel test because they were constantly talking about the Doctor. Yeah. That's so interesting. But now that they have a doctor who's female, they're actually getting better and passing the Bechdel test. <laughs> yeah. 
They're like, they're up in their game. Well, I just need to throw out my favorite sci-fi author, author then while we're at it, Becky Chambers. She's, she's a new author and, and she is specifically, you know, writing stories that from my perspective, you know, addresses this issue. She has strong female characters. They're not just based around their male counterparts. She has characters that are non-binary that use, you know, a whole variety of different pronouns and expose you to the, you know, the different ways of interacting with people that is just totally normalized uh, in a way that we're not used to in other, in other types of, of, of writing. And she also writes with, with beautiful, you know, um, human characters that aren't just like plot pieces Mm because sci-fi often, especially the old sci-fi, like you can't be a good sci-fi writer and good at character development. You know what I mean? So she does, she is able to tie in both of them. So anyway, anybody who's interested in good sci-fi, check out Becky Chambers. I needed to throw her out there because I, I I will say if you're just gonna, if we're just gonna throw out like really great, uh, sci-fi writers, do it. Uh, NK Jemsen, Jen, Jensen. I always forget how to say her last name. Um, but she is the author of the, what is it? The fifth, it's not the fifth element. That's totally a movie and wine has happened. Um, That's a movie that probably like, not passed the best shell test, incidentally. No, movie, no, though. it didn't. Um, but like she is a fantastic writer and she like Neil Gaiman has actually come out and said that like she is one of the most prolific sci-fi writers of our time. And um she also happens to be a black woman. And so she writes from a black perspective, but she also does the same thing where she's introducing characters who are non-binary. She's introducing characters who are facing adversity. And like, because she's introducing, introducing it from a black perspective, she's looking at how are these characters facing adversity both in a racial capacity and also um in just being a minority where they are and also the sci-fi aspect of it which again brings me back to Lovecraft Country because Lovecraft Country does this (laughs) in such an amazing way John still hasn't seen it I'm gonna like make him watch it after this is it a film or a Lovecraft Country it's a show on HBO okay Cool. And we can happily watch the first few episodes together. I've seen nice. the whole season and oh my God, it's one of the best things on TV right now. And like, as far as sci-fi goes, like I'm not super into like Lovecraftian type horror or Lovecraftian style sci-fi, but holy fuck does this show do that whole genre a like great service. And That's awesome. It's really great because um, the whole show is the most beautiful fuck you to H.P. Lovecraft. And like the whole like first half of the first episode, they keep bringing up how aggressively racist H.P. Lovecraft was. Mm -hmm. And like they stop just short of pointing out what the name of his cat was. And for those listening and or watching if you were ever unclear about whether or not H.P. Lovecraft was actually pretty fucking racist, just Google the name of his fucking cat. So what is it? I'm not fucking telling you, like, I'm not saying the name of his cat. Literally pull your phone out and Google it because I'm, do it. I, I'm not trying to get <laughs> cut by our, our censors. That you see. Just keep it in your head. Yeah. Uh, deal. And the thing is, like in the show, they quote one of H.P. Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft's incredibly. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. See, what? there's a reason why I didn't say that shit out loud. Yeah. What year is this? So anyways. Until 1904. Jesus. Uh huh. Yeah. No, H.P. Lovecraft. Super duper racist. It's a little overt. Uh, <laughs> a little. Uh, a lot wow. all right so yeah um like i said if you were unsure google, google the name of his fucking cat um so in the show like the first half of the first episode they quote one of his like super fucking racist poems and like point out that this man was hilariously racist but they also point out that like the main character who happens or one of the main characters who is black um is a huge fan of H.P. Lovecraft, despite knowing that he is racist. But at the time, it was the only 
type of science fiction in that genre available. Right. And so it was kind of a fuck. I don't have any other options. Well, this is the importance of diversity, you know, right. and, and that's kind of what I was getting at here is that like, you know, we don't even realize what we're missing out on when we don't have people of diverse backgrounds taking part in certain activities. And that's the you know problem that science has had from the beginning and that all the science was either done by wealthy white men or done within communities of wealthy white men and was somewhat bias isn't the right word, but short sighted, like lacking perspective that you can only get by increasing the diversity within the people doing it as well as the people being studied. And, and that's, you know, I'm, I'm so curious to hear about your, your experience with that. Well, I would say that bias is definitely the right word. And, and mm -hmm. also that saying, you know, people choosing to do science is probably the wrong word because I think historically science has actively and aggressively kept people of diverse backgrounds out of science. Yes. Um, and in fact, you know, I and I think this is one of the advantages of coming from anthropology. Anthropology, as we know it, was founded on racism. Anthropology came out of the yep. eugenics movement. And, really? and we are painfully aware of that fact and like go to great efforts to, to make it clear like that that is where we come from and that is what we have to correct. And I think that is something that a lot of scientists don't have necessarily. And, and lots of scientists have contributed to racism and systemic oppression in various ways. But not all yeah. of them are so like aggressively aware of where they came from. Um, and American right. anthropology, which is sort of a distinct way of, of teaching and thinking about anthropology, came from a man named Franz Boas, who actually sort of made his career by discrediting a lot of these early racist anthropologists who would do all sorts of weird shit, like measure people's skulls. They had like giant mm -hmm. collections of skulls and they'd be like, black skulls are like this and white skulls are like this and these are Asian skulls and just make up shit about like the, the me measurements and metrics of the yeah. skulls. And Franz Boas came in and he's like, okay, I will use exactly your methodology and do all of these measurements myself and just, but, but be unbiased about it and actually report the results. And I will show you that there is no statistical difference between these measurements of these people. And, and right. that was sort of the founding. And again, he is a white man from Germany. So I'm not saying that we came from a diverse founding either. But but the thing about it also, hmm? I will say like it probably he was probably only going to be listened to because he happened to be a white man. Because oh, if a black man had come in and said, uh, all of this shit is bunk, let me show you that black man would have not been listened to or a black woman in that like any capacity was not going to be listened to, but like a German man coming in saying I'm the most white man, like <laughs> Hitler supported my whiteness. Right. And was like, yeah, I'm super fucking white. Let me tell you how wrong you are. Yeah. That I, I, that's going to have a lot more merit. Absolutely. And I should, I should mention that Franz Boas was well before Hitler. He died in 1942. So. Oh, so like, yeah, like he died right before Hitler. He did. He just got out of it before Germany got extra bad. Um, wow. But yeah, so I, I mean, I think because of that, like anthropology is, is particularly aware of its origins and, and where we, we've come from. And like human genetics is also, I think, a bit more aware of that than other areas of genetics, because a lot of early human genetics was trying to do exactly the same thing. And, you know, we have ethics classes that we have to take in in uh, grad school as biologists is sort of like a part of the way that the NIH works and the way that we're funded and everything. We have to take ethics classes, which I think is good. And sometimes so that's being mandated by the government. I believe so. Yeah. I believe so that would be out of efforts from Congress. I honestly don't know exactly how this works. Interesting. I do believe it's mandated by the NIH, but I think the way that okay. it's made up is sort of dependent on the school. Um, and I know that like the later class of ethics we do sort of towards the end of our career is specific by program. It's not just like all of biology. Um, and in that one, we have like a whole section on the history of how fucked genetics has been. And that's, wow. I mean, that's been leveraged in the modern era. This hasn't gone away. So something that like we can do in genetics now that I think is a really, it, it's a risky thing is that we do things in genetics called GWAS and it's sort of like the bread and butter of like large scale genetics. It's sort of like the idea of doing like an MRI in neuroscience where it doesn't really tell you anything, but it hints at a lot of things. Um, right. And so GWAS stands for genome wide association study. Um, what that basically means is I can take, let's say, let's imagine I take a hundred people and I sequence all of their genomes or I genotype them, which means I look at specific areas of the genome where I know things vary, like where I have a T and you have an A. There's a mm -hmm. much smaller number of those, so you don't have to do as much sequencing if you do it that way. 
Um, but in any case, you look at their genomes and you look at how they vary. And then you look at a specific trait, whatever trait you want to. And because now we have all of these databases, you can really pick anything as long as you've collected data on that phenotype. So let's say I care about height. I can look at right. 100 people and say, everyone, this one's 5'2", this one's 5'5", five five, whatever it is. And then look at every single place across their genome where they vary and then do a bunch of tests and say, you know, for, for this part of the genome, 90% of people who are taller or who are over 5'5 five five or whatever it is have an A here, whereas the people who tend to be shorter have like a T here, whatever it is. Right. But you do this sort of at a massive scale. So you, you look across the whole genome and you'll make these plots that are called Manhattan plots, not for any reason other than the fact that they look like a skyline of Manhattan because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I Amazing. really thought it was because they were invented there. No, it's just because they look like the skyline of Manhattan, which I think is very heartwarming. Um, <laughs> But you can do this for any trait. And then what you can do from that is, is so that you'll figure out, okay, so like height is super polygenic. It's contributed to by hundreds of genes. And, and we can sort of make a metric of like, this gene contributes to it, you know, this much. And this gene contributes to it a little bit more. And so you sort of, you can have sort of weighted amounts of like, if you have a T here, you're gonna probably be taller, but it only contributes to height, like, you know, 0.1% or whatever it is, right? You'll have like a little thing that weights how much each of those loci contribute to the trait. And so you can come up with these things called polygenic scores where you can predict how, you know, based on someone's genome without knowing anything about how tall they are, you can say, okay, well, based on all of this, if I add in all these scores together, I think you're going to be five, seven. And that okay. sounds cool and interesting and fun if you're just thinking about it from a genetic standpoint. But if let's say somebody does something really terrifying like a she was on intelligence or on sexuality or on you know anything else and then you start trying to make predictions then you can start doing really troubling things like being like oh well the average polygenic score of african populations is lower problem with that is as i said most of these gwas where we determine how we make these scores are from white europeans and mm -hmm. so alleles don't necessarily exist or have the same weight or interact in the same way in other populations. So the scores are not gonna be the same. And so, but I mean, and this is true. There have been articles about this, like white supremacists are getting a hold of this information and like doing like crazy pseudoscience bullshit with it. And that's scary. And like, as, as people who sort of do this and come up with this and put this stuff out there, like, we're kind of responsible for that. And we need to like think really carefully about how we do things. And I think there is like a big risk with people who will put out studies about like, oh, we've run a GWAS on human sexuality. Like, oh, okay, but Jesus, like think a little bit because you're putting this out a loaded weapon. Right. And, and you mean, and that's where science communication becomes key because I don't think we should just not study things, but we need mm, to- really right think carefully and contextualize about how we study things. And then once we do study them, how we communicate it. And, and that's right. tricky, right? Because the media doesn't always communicate things the same way that scientists try to communicate things. Right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you, like, we did um, an episode on the discovery of phosphine gas on Venus and the way that the media is reporting the discovery of phosphine gas on media or on Venus is completely different from how the researchers who worked on it are talking yeah. about it. Cause they're like, uh, we don't want to actually talk about the possibility of life on Venus because like we can't rule that out, but that's not really actually what we're potentially looking at. This is just kind of an anomaly, but like yeah. the media is just like, so life on Venus. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's 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 natural though because that's that's what people are, are going to be interested in. They're not interested in finding out that there's some new way to produce phosphine gas that we weren't previously aware of. You know, that's not really a sexy headline right there. It's not going to get you clicks. So, yeah, I mean the media issue is, is a big issue. But I mean, like you're saying, I think this is so interesting to, to recognize though that diversity of perspective is the only way that we're able to recognize that hey, maybe this research is uh, missing something. Mm -hmm. You know, and that diversity of perspective has to come not just from outside, but also from within the scientific community. And that's why it requires having diversity within the scientific community. So what has your experience been in your in, in you know, being a Ph.D. candidate so far? Do you go to conferences as a, as a Ph.D. candidate? I mean, I definitely did. Now, now nobody really goes. Right. To right. Uh, yes. I've gone to a few virtual ones. But yeah, I, I've been to conferences. 
and and what do you feel like progress is being made within the scientific community in the sense of like is are you seeing more diversity? I I mean even just gender diversity. In my time here, I'm I'm not sure I would say. I mean, I've seen it in small ways. I've definitely seen individual programs that have upped diversity. I mean, I, I worked with a, a group that was founded at UChicago, and you should absolutely interview some of the people who made this group because it's incredible. And they did all these grassroots efforts to try to increase diversity and inclusion within the grad Wasn't population. That one of your friends that you introduced me to the other night yeah. on Zoom? Yeah. yeah was- we definitely need to get her on the show. Her pronouns are she, her, right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to double check. Yep. Yeah. Add her to the list. Get her on the board. Sign her up. She does a ton of other work, not just with that group, but also like at, at UChicago writ large and in other places to, to work on, on diversity in the, the entire university. And, and that's so you should talk to her about that because I'm, I'm going to be able to give sort of a poor version of what she could tell you about this. But I don't want to sound too cynical. I just, I don't know that I've necessarily witnessed things getting better. I've definitely seen like some really incredible efforts from students and some, and some professors and faculty and things like this too. I just think the institution is so big and so dense in a lot of academic places that it's, it's, it can be really challenging. Like I've watched job searches happen and they're pretty transparent about it, which I think is probably good. Like maybe it's actually better in academics and other places. And I just haven't seen like the worst version of this, but I've right. seen like job searches where they're like, we're trying to recruit a diverse candidate. And then they interview five white men. And I'm like, I don't understand what we've done here. Yeah. Like how define your diversity. If you didn't have a single woman, a single person of color, anyone who is like gender non-binary or like gender queer in some capacity or like anyone who is like minoritized in any capacity you just have is that a word minoritized that's the first time i've heard it that's cool it's a cool word it, you don't gotta get all angry with me it's a, no, i've never I'm, heard the word before no it's i'm not don't getting give me that look i'm not getting angry i'm just i'm trying to think if i just like came up with oh okay that or <laughs> if that i I feel like I've heard minoritized. that. Minoritized. Interesting. Yeah, I feel like I've heard that word before. I feel like I didn't just come up with that. I might have just come up with that. I, at this point, I'm not 100% sure. Like I said, wine has happened. But like. <laughs> oh, cheers. Yeah. Cheers to that. Cheer, indeed. Cheers, y'all. I got, I got my sippy cup here. Your sippy cup of White Claw? No, we're not. We're not branding it. Your we're sip- not sponsored. <laughs> Your your sippy cup of unbranded uh, seltzer. It's just hard seltzer. seltzer. Wow. So okay, that's interesting. I I mean, on the record, while we're while we're here, that I don't think that this problem is specific to my university. I'm not speaking about specifically mine. I think this is a problem. Oh yeah, that is universal to you know all hundred percent. Well, I think that this is just universal to uh, higher learning in general because, like, as we already know, that higher learning the way that it is designed and the way that it's set up um, both through standardized testing and through tuition fees are like meant in every capacity to keep minorities, especially uh, black and brown minorities out of higher university, like higher education in general. So it's not that like we're talking about any one campus that's like, oh, well, this one campus is actually not great. Because like obviously if you're like at Brown or Howard, you're going to have a lot more diversity in um, the people. But like that's like a historically black campus. Yeah. Like that's not – that's different than if you had a place like NYU where – NYU is hilariously expensive, especially if you're coming from out of state. So even if you have the SAT scores, which you have to pay money to take the SATs, you have to pay money to take the ACTs, and those standardized tests, the way they are set up, are absolutely set up in a hilariously racist way um, and are geared towards white people to be able to pass those tests. So even if you are able to get the scores to get into um, NYU, you like most minority families um, across the board aren't going to be able to afford 
sending their kid to NYU and so are going to be more likely to send them in state or going to be more likely to send them to a community college, at least until they can afford to send them or get a scholarship to NYU. So like the disenfranchisement of minorities starts before you even get to campus. So by the time you actually get to campus, the disenfranchisement within the facilities in campus is almost lessened because like once you're already there, they're like, Oh my God, you're a minority. We absolutely want to get you into this program Mm. because we want to show diversity in our program. But getting to that campus to get into that program, you're already jumping through so many more hurdles. So, I mean, that's the problem, but I think that it's important to also talk about like, how is this affecting society at large as a result of not having a diverse enough perspective within these programs. And, and I think that that's, that's the kind of message that we really need to try to, to spread and to get to resonate with people to recognize that like when you don't have the, the, the right level of diversity, you end up hampering your ability to learn about the world and as a society, your ability to do the right science. And that's why I think it's so interesting to hear from you, you know, and uh, in, in your perspective on like, you know, we have to be careful about like how we do the science, who's doing the science, what type of people we're studying and, and, and what that tells us about, you know, the, the information that we're able to get as a result of it. Yeah. Well, okay. So, but I, I do want to get to that, but I want to, I want to real quick go back to what Alicia was saying, because I think that that's really important. And we talk about it as sort of uh, like, I'm hurt. I'm sure you've heard this term before, but the leaky pipeline where like you lose, you lose diversity, not at the level of graduate school, but you lose it all along the way to get there, you know, like even, mm. even to get, you know, not even just the cost of taking the SATs, but like, if you're not going to as good of a school, if you don't go to a private school that teaches you how to like go to the SAT classes and all of these things, like you lose, you lose, you lose people. And then when you get into these institutions, you're right. Like maybe there's a little bit less because people are stoked to have like their one person who is diversity at their school. But then you have to do all the extra labor of like, you're the one person of diversity at this school. Yeah. And now everyone wants so you, you to you either. Have- yeah. So you either take on the role of being the token or you take on the role of speaking for your minority as a whole, which as we know, black people and like all minorities in general aren't a fucking monolith. So if you're like the one brown person in the room, everyone's going to look to you and be like, oh, cool. So here's this thing. Is this racist? Is it okay if I say this? Are you cool with this thing? And it's like, You then have to become an expert not only on whatever it is that you're studying, but then you also have to become an expert on race and race politics and race dynamics because you have to now start teaching all of the people around you because you've been either tokenized or you've become their only go-to of information where they feel like, oh, well, you're the only black friend I have. So I have to ask you all of the questions that I have to ask you because you're the only black friend I know. So you have to answer all the questions for me and you have no other options. Which I would argue is also definitely tokenizing. (laughs) Oh, a thousand percent. I mean, like it's still, it's, Still, it's two different sides of the token coin. Like you either become whitewashed as the token and you're just like, I'm just one of you, which was me growing up, or (laughs) you flip the coin and become, ah, I am the voice of an entire fucking people, which most of the people that I am speaking for, like, we don't all agree on a variety of things. Like if you just like look at the black community, we don't all agree on fucking Kanye. Like <laughs> that's just like one thing. And like, you would think that that would be really easy to agree. Like, okay, well, Kanye's out here saying some fuck shit. So like, we should all agree that like, we should throw his stupid ass out at this point. Oh no, no, no. But like Kanye makes really good music. He's such a great artist. And like, we like, we have to like, He's gone through some shit ever since his mom died. He like, he's gone through some shit. No, he was a goddamn like textbook narcissist. He was a narcissist before his mom died. He was a narcissist after his mom died. We don't have to give him shit. But like, of course, within the black community, there is not any sort of like monolithic voice because that is what happens with minorities. So when you are tokenized in that capacity, you're just like, oh, cool. So I have to speak for an entire minority and 
there's no real consensus on this. But now I have to do a whole bunch of research to make sure that I don't speak out of turn or like I'm just going to go along with whatever my white friends say so that they keep inviting me to parties. Like (laughs) it's too like it's either or. And especially in a campus world, that can be really fucking tough because you stand out so much. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think you're doing all that extra work. Right. And so at at this point, the levels of diversity we have now, you know, our our diverse community is is taking on all of these extra roles in addition to trying to be students and researchers and doing, you know, like I am at my wit's end just trying to get through this PhD and I am not being forced to take on as many extra roles as a lot of students I work next to. And so like we're not even getting to have the advantages, like you're saying, of having a more sort of diverse community of researchers lending their perspectives because honestly like all of us are just trying to get by at this point right and so you know it's not until we increase that and and one of the things that like really struck me recently that somebody said to me is that I think a lot of people and this extends to to sort of all areas of diversity to women in science to queer people in science to everything is that like there's sort of this this almost like like competitive urge that people will get I see this a lot with especially white women in science of like well like we acknowledge that science can be sexist but like if you're the best you're still going to get a job and it becomes this weird competition and it's like I want to get to the point where we have some fucking mediocrity like I see so many mediocre white men get these positions and like just let us be mediocre for once like don't be like you have to be the best goddamn woman scientist there's ever been and then you'll succeed or go back to being a housewife like those are your options you either are the best or you're a housewife and it's like but I mean there's so (laughs) many like mediocre white men who are doing the like barely passable jobs that like I am doing a better job at already and can do a better job at but because I'm a woman I can't take their place because he's a man and like what the fuck like don't get me wrong there are some incredible unbelievable best of all women in science I mean we were talking about Chris Burns so Jennifer Dada Manuel Chabantier just won the Nobel Amazing yeah. women in science. But listen, I just want to be fucking like average sometimes. <laughs> like, I want to yep. be like, mm. I want to, for once in my life, get a, like a C on something or just fail an experiment and not have to like lose all faith in myself as a human. Like, <laughs> how diverse is no, the Nobel Prize? Nobel? Uh, Pri- Nobel? Nobel? I don't Nobel. know. My guess would be that it's not very. Right. I think it's more diverse between gender and not between race. Yeah. Because I know that like, um, didn't Hedy Lamarr win a Nobel Prize or was that Ada Lovelace? I don't know that either of them did. Mary Curie. I know. Okay. I know. Okay. So I like. Her daughter, I believe. Pardon? I think her daughter also won one. I think the Curie family is the most Nobel family in like all time. <laughs> okay, well that's just fucking dope and also unsurprising because like I mean Marie Curie like literally gave her fucking life for like radioactive research, so that's fucking dope. Um, but I don't know why. Okay, so I guess Ada Lovelace, it makes sense that she wouldn't have won the Nobel Prize because like they definitely would have it wouldn't have given it to her. But um, for some reason, I was thinking that, um, wow, I just fucking blanked on that name. Just completely gone. Wow. Heidi Lamar? Thank you, Heidi Lamar. Um, Because, like, she invented fucking Wi-Fi. No, neither of them won it. I'm looking looking at the list. Let's see what Mm. the... Boo! Heidi Lamar absolutely deserved a fucking Nobel Prize for her bullshit because, like, she was on some next level shit. She was on some Tesla fucking shit. But I guess, like, Tesla didn't win any fucking Nobel Prizes either. So, you know, what's really funny to do in in my university and probably in most is that, like, the hospital that we have here has, like, a hallway where they have, like, like framed pictures of like the classes of years gone by for like like you can go back to like 1903 like way whenever UChicago was founded I suppose 
and he can right. walk and he, as you walk down the hallway because I, I work part-time in like the the hospital lab spaces and as you walk up you just watch as more and more faces become women and you start to wait until you see any faces that aren't white and you just sort of like oh like I suppose things are getting better <laughs> like the early <laughs> ah, sort of ah, yes like, there's the two not white faces wonderful wonderful so there's obviously the importance of, of fairness but but what what are the other reasons why that diver- diversity is so important well, I just think like, like, I mean, like we talked about earlier with, with the, the complexity and the danger and the ethical quandaries that you get into with stuff, uh, you know, g- genetically speaking, I think if you don't have people that are coming from a perspective that can actively be harmed, I mean, this sucks to say because everyone should advocate for everyone. But I think when you're from communities that are going to actively be harmed, you obviously advocate a lot harder and you don't have to look a lot farther to see that than like the past election where a fucking ton of the heavy lifting of advocacy and grassroots effort were done by the communities most likely to be really adversely affected by another Trump term. And so I think, yeah. you know, for, like, for example, like I, I have a huge problem with like people trying to do like the GWAS on sexuality. And I, I have concerns about how they frame those studies. So the one that I was talking about, and it was run by a lot of people who weren't necessarily geneticists, but they had like sort of like psych- psychologist backgrounds, I believe which I already think is a little bit scary because we're straying onto the grounds of like, like sexuality as like a, an issue of psychology. Um, but also like they define sexuality in such a bizarre binary way. Like it was like straight or had had any gay experience was their, their right. binary variable. And you don't have to do that, but if you don't, you know, like a lot of these tools to do these genetic analysis are so easy to access. Like, I mean, you guys could probably pretty easily find some online and like run them yourself. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think if we're not careful about that, don't think exactly about how these things are going to come out. Like that's, that's a little scary. And I think like if you have more diverse people, like I wanted just one queer person on that team to be like, yo, this is a weird ass way to define sexuality. Like what? Right. You, yeah. You can run GWAS on traits that are not binary. Like you could choose to have a spectrum trait and they chose not to do that. Like, right. right. And it takes somebody who actually has life experience in these issues to be able to, to point that out. And, and if you don't have somebody like that in the room, you're simply not doing your work correctly. And you, you don't even have the ability to know that you're missing out on something because you don't have somebody in the room who can point it out to you. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's way- just about like catching the problems. Right. But there's also like, like the things that you study and you know, the, the questions that you ask. And I think, and I, I mean, you, you should check me on this because I, I haven't checked this recently, but people have done studies about like in various, like increasing diversities of, of groups and like the type of, of, results those groups put out and it's generally considered to be true that the more diverse backgrounds your group has like the more the more success that you have with any given problem because you have different perspectives like you think about things differently you can see wait that's actual research that's been done people have done this research i've seen like this is why i don't want to cite this because i don't know the article but i've seen like the cover of nature that had some people with a canoe (laughs) I don't remember the study, but I have like an image in my brain. So I'll find it. I need to look into that. Yeah, I need to look into that. That's amazing because I I have a, a, you know, just a a larger theory in general that that diversity is important. Like just not even looking at human beings, but when you look at, you know, for example, um, diversity within populations, um, when, when any, when, whenever any population becomes too homogenous, it loses its ability to kind of discover new things and, and to be able to progress. And, and you end up stagnating and diversity just in, from a general perspective is what gives you these like trial and error things on the edges where it's like people are learning new things here and they're trying new things there. And then you can kind of integrate that into the larger experience that everybody has if you're able to have people branching out in different ways. And as soon as you make things homogenous, you end up limiting the system as a whole from its ability to kind of discover the best ways to, you know, engage with the world. And yeah, yeah, I'd love to see research that kind of uh, shows that that's true because it's something I kind of feel innately, but um, it's not necessarily something that everybody, everybody feels innately. So you have to. It's certainly the case, right? A hundred percent. You need a level of diversity within a population for evolution to occur. If you have a homogenous population, you you know, you need things to go wrong. You need things to go right. You need. Right. Changes. And, and, you know, a big thing. Do you know what the number is? What number? When it comes to a human population, like let's say you're going to take a group of humans and send them off into space. How many people do you need for them to be able to survive long term and have genetic diversity? I have no idea, but I think that would very much depend on the initial diversity of the population you sent. If you sent five white oh. people, I think you'd have some problems. Right? Oh, 
But are we talking like a thousand people, like 500? Do we know? I mean, you don't need that many, obviously. I think oh, there's really? some theories to suggest that like the, the initial founding of the Americas could have been a population of less than 20. I mean, you can found 20. population, but, but, you know, Native Americans are, are one of the most genetically similar Diverse. populations on the planet. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. To settle out of Africa. So right, they, right. It sort of depends on the diversity that you want. You you start with what's sort of called standing variation, and the amount of standing variation is going to determine how quickly you can change. So something we talk about in genetics is that you can adapt much faster if you have more standing variation in, in your population. So imagine like this isn't really true, John, because unfortunately you and me probably share a lot of genetic diversity because we are both white people. But if, I mean, imagine the three of us have have a fair bit of genetic diversity. Um, that doesn't really do anything for us. So there are a lot of differences between our genomes that don't make a difference. They don't really affect how we live our lives. They don't have any sort of effect on, on phenotype that matters in this context. But let's say all of a sudden we're forced into a new weird situation, like we all go live on Mars. And there's something about Mars, like the, the slight change in gravity, the slight change in, in atmospheric concentration that affects us in such a way that all of a sudden, like, this one allele that Alicia has, but we don't becomes really advantageous. Mm. Then, you know, let's assume that now we're a much larger population and, you know, half of those people have the allele that Alicia has, but half right. of them don't. having that already there makes us able to evolve a lot faster because like the sort of traditional way we think about evolution is you go over many, 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 many generations. Then at some point, some mutation happens and right. it's lucky and it happens to be in that right place, but you have to go through so many goddamn generations and humans right. live a long time. <laughs> and so like the odds of like populations surviving that are small, if you have to wait for that to happen are, are pretty low, depending on how interesting the pressure is. So obviously you're going to do better as a small population if you have a good amount of standing variation. So that at least somebody is going to maybe have something that's useful in that context. That makes sense. Um, so yeah, hmm. certainly, certainly genetically that's true and you can sort of generalize it and, and make the claim that, yeah, like you can imagine in, in people that would be true too. Like if you have enough diversity of perspectives and all of a sudden we're thrown into a new situation, like, oh, I don't know if fucking dictatorship happens to America, which oh, I imagine that could happen, then having nope. a diversity of opinions could be extremely useful. Right. right. So, so, and that's, that's, what we're talking like from a general perspective here, like diversity is important in order to enable a system or a grouping of organisms to be able to survive changes in environment or to be able to thrive in conditions that you can't predict. Yeah. But the more I diversity that, you have yeah. as the change, as the conditions change, the more likely you're going to be able to have uh, something, so, some subset of, of your larger group that's able to, to handle that. Yeah. Better. And there have been theories of human evolution that suggest that was sort of the reason that humans were able to survive and thrive because we're not we're not very good predators. Like if you think of us sort of innately as like an animal, there's not really a lot we bring to the table. Like if we, especially if you look at other primates, we're much weaker than most other great apes. And like, yet we've somehow kicked all their asses. We really can't survive without clothing and things like this in, in most environments. But but the thing that we have that they don't is is very large and complex brains and complex societies and complex diversity. Right people and, and opinions and, and, you know, ways of doing things. And so there's a thought that like humans evolved in this rapidly changing landscape. There was a lot more volcanic activity at the time. There was a lot of things, there was ice ages, a lot of things were changing. And so the ability to sort of adapt from sort of just like a, a mental level or just being able to change and rapidly, humans populate some of the most diverse environments on the planet. Like most animal yeah. populations don't do that especially yeah. given how like closely related we are. We're not like separate populations of humans living in the Arctic and the, you know, the, the islands of the Caribbean, like we are really similar. Right. And so right. We have this sort of, you know, uh, ability of, of mind, of ideas, of cultural development that allow us to do this. And, you know, that's maybe why we've become the dominant, you know, at least mammal on the planet. So what so, you're trying to say is that humans are pretty awesome. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, we also kind of fucking suck sometimes, but like what I'm trying to say is that we really need to try hard to pre preserve the diversity of, of ideas, of people, of, of thoughts, of creeds, of everything. Yeah. Because otherwise we're fucked. I mean, we're kind of probably fucked anyways, but that's just my millennial negativity talking. So, <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, um, both being coming from an anthropology uh, background and also coming from like a biology and geneticist background. What is your opinion on gender? <laughs> uh, 
I have been and in- like also from like a human background or, or even just like what's the difference between gender and sex you know yeah so I've been in a lot of internet fights about this um, <laughs> and, and I, I believe the opinion of sort of the, the scientific consensus sex and gender first of all are, are different um, sex and a term that we sort of used to use a lot and bandy about was biological sex we don't use that as much anymore we use defined at birth uh, that tends to refer to sort of the way that we categorize sex generally. That also can be a little bit complicated. Mostly people think about that as like, you know, a baby's born, we look at their genitalia and we decide boy, girl, and that's your sex assigned at birth. Obviously, genetically speaking, that can be a bit more complicated. There's a lot of various ways your genetics can alter that, for example. like So one of the weird things about, about sex is that genetically, the parts of the X and Y chromosome, well, the X chromosome that define sex and, and the Y chromosome. So, okay, rolling back. The X and Y chromosome, right? They have to recombine. Every chromosome in your cell has to recombine in order for cells to divide. You've probably heard about like mitosis, meiosis, right? In like yeah. grade school and haven't really thought about it since, which is understandable. <laughs> Not something that you would but all the chromosomes sort of do this little dance where they line up, they do some recombination and they divide from meiosis, right? Um, the thing is, is all the other chromosomes are identical copies of each other, right? You have two, one chromosomes, two twos, two threes, whatever, all the way down the line. The X and Y, I don't know if you've ever seen like a karyotype where they visualize all the chromosomes. The Y is like the smallest goddamn thing. And it's like, it is, it is, it is actually falling apart. Like there have been, the Y chromosome is slowly degrading because it doesn't really recombine. Like most of it doesn't do anything. There's very few genes on it. It's, it's the smallest, littlest, tiniest chromosome. The X chromosome is goddamn huge. It does a ton of work because everyone has to have one. You can't survive without an X chromosome, right? Men have an X and a Y. Women have two X's and women, in fact, in almost every cell in your body, one of those two X's is silenced completely because it, your cells would freak the fuck out if you had genes from both X's being expressed at once because there's so much going on in the X chromosome. So, the, and that's a whole nother story. But the point being is now in men, you have this tiny dinky little Y chromosome and this <laughs> massive X chromosome. They're supposed to line up and recombine. And that's pretty weird. Um, and the way that they know to recombine is that the very top edges of them are pretty similar to each other. And so those two little mm-hmm. top, the X chromosome like fully folds in half to like recombine with the Y. And so those edges, those edges that actually recombine with each other are called pseudo autosomal regions because they sort of resemble the rest of the chromosomes because they recombine. What is very close to the pseudo autosomal regions is a gene called SRY. And that determines like basically the entire pathway that leads to external male genitalia. And because it's so close to that crossover region, there's actually like a non, you know, insignificant chance that that can occasionally cross over onto the X. So you can have XX chromosomes and have external male genitalia. So the, how people want to define sex is even sort of a little bit confusing. Are you going to be like, oh, well, it's your chromosome. Right. Or are you going to be like, oh, it's whether or not you have a dick, which, you know, a lot of people seem to sort of ignore the female genitalia. It's really all down to do you have a penis or not. Men right. are very focused on penises, I've found. Surprisingly um, so. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, they're kind of cool. I mean, I suppose. I mean, as someone, who, you don't see women, as someone like, who's played with a strap on plenty, plenty, yeah, it's great to have a dick, but like, <laughs> it's not a requirement. It's definitely not overrated. Just <laughs> <laughs> anyway. It might be overrated. <laughs> it's a little overrated. <laughs> in, in any case, the point of this sort of elongated, weird story is that, like, even if you think about just how we define sort of sex assigned at birth, that is not a sort of a distinct binary. You can very easily have these sort of complicated situations where like your external, how we define sex and and sort of internal chromosomal ways we define sex differ. Um, mm-hmm. And that just sort of ramps up extremely when you get into things like gender, which is not something that is, is biologically defined in any way. It is something that is sort of culturally defined, personally defined. Um, and that is sort of how you perceive your external presentation of gender to, to society. And that's going to be based to large part, like how society defines gender around you um, and how you understand gender and sex within yourself. And that's going to be a very personal choice, obviously. But point being is that even if you want to like get angry and aggro and talk about like, oh, well, science says there's only boys and girls. Science does not say that. <laughs> science yeah. 
that like everything else, gender and sex and all of it exists along a spectrum and, and people need to really get off the internet is my conclusion. <laughs> that was the most perfect answer to that question. Like, especially like from a science perspective, because it's like, oh, well, yeah, I love how a lot of people say, oh, you know, um, in nature, like homosexuality doesn't exist in nature. It does. I love how people say that like multiple genders don't exist in nature. They do. Um, so like even within just like humanity itself, um, multiple genders exist both on a chromosomal chron chromosomal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Level. And, um, uh, like biological level and like a presentation level. So like there are multiple levels of gender in your expression of them, both through like your societal uh, ex expression of them and like just fucking your chromosomes saying, ah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. And you can say that like in various, you know, in humans or in animals or whatever like that, that population that sort of defies the way that we like to binarize things is small, but that doesn't really matter because what you can also think of is that there's probably a lot of bleed in from the sides. It's not like there's two fucking like boxes and then there's a few people that sort of scatter themselves into the middle. That's just not how biology works. Like look at any right. trait, like things don't exist. Humans are particularly good at making patterns and it's, it's probably helped us to evolve and survive, but we really like to box things in mm. ways that don't always make a lot of sense. And we've done this with how we sort of understand race too, which is also culturally defined and is not consistent from place to place. But it's Correct. weird because you can imagine other ways we could have done it. And, and it, you know, we, we could have done it based on, on weird bits of eye color, like all blue eyed people are in one race. Or we could have done it based on blood group, bit harder to define, but we could have done that. And like all O group people, are, there's just random and arbitrary ways that you can choose to group people. And in America, we group people in very odd ways because we, we, we group it based on sort of a bizarre understanding of like slight differentiations in skin color and just say everyone who's not a fucking ghost goes into this box. <laughs> and, you know, but, but that matters too, because that becomes a lived experience. Once we create this culture and the same thing is true for, for gender, right? Like it doesn't matter if we're wrong in how we define femininity, which I think we are, but because our culture understands what it means to be a woman in that way, that's going to change how people like choose to like align themselves in, in things. And I, I mean, I think there's probably a reason why we see a lot more bisexual women than men for, for one example. And I think that's probably because it is a lot more culturally acceptable for women to be more in the middle of that spectrum and be more exploratory than it is for men to be. Men are sort of, in my opinion, forced to, to sort of sit in, in binary bins a lot right. more by they're either society. gay or straight. And even when they're bisexual, they're labeled as gay. Yeah. I mean, and women who are bisexual are typically labeled as straight, but we're given a little more leeway, I think. In it's like straight, but like you occasionally kiss girls. But like if you're bi, it's like, are you bi though? Are you actually bi? Do you really like women? Or do you just like to kiss girls sometimes at the bar? Um, remember when you could like kiss girls at the bar and remember not have to worry could, about dying? Could kiss one at a bar? Oh my God. Remember bars? Oh my god! Plug in my computer because I just realized I didn't do that because I got too excited to talk to you, and now I have two percent battery. <laughs> oh no! Bars are thriving in New York. Yeah, but like New York is an unusual yeah. situation, and also like bar culture. Once it gets cold, like, like bar, like original bar culture where you would just like be kind of like hanging out with a bunch of strangers and interacting and, and interacting yeah, with that's strangers. What, that doesn't exist. Right. Like you can go to a bar. But you're at a table with the people that you went with and you're yes. like not interacting with anybody else, ideally. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, is it fair to say that sex is referring to kind of like the biology and gender is referring to the psychology? Uh, I, I wouldn't phrase it that way. I mean, I think you're getting... What's wrong about that phrasing? Um, okay. Well, saying, saying sex is referring to biology is a little weird because it sort of implies that like, because usually when people say sex, they're going to say like male or female, right? They're going to follow that right. up with one of those. But, you, but you've explained how the biology doesn't necessarily have to be binary. I understand that, but I also explained how like culture sort of defines how things are. And it doesn't matter if that's true or not. It still affects people's lived experiences, right? So if people are going to follow up 
sex with biology and then with male or female that sort of reinforces the notion that biological sex is a thing it's a binary thing and it is sort of a, a permanent thing that is defined by your biology and you can't change it and that's what it is and i think that can be a harmful claim and i know that like we can understand that differently and so like maybe for for us we can think about it that way and that would be okay but i think sort of I mean, and, and like I said, as a geneticist, as a biologist, we have to think really carefully about how you communicate ideas to, to everyone else because people are going to take that differently. Right. So I, I would say, you know, the difference to me is there is is sex assigned at birth. And that is sort of based on sort of the cultural understanding of how we just put, you know, MRF on a birth certificate. There is that. And then right. there is gender, which is how a person comes to understand their relationship with with sort of the ideas of gender in their individual culture. Um, and right. I don't know that you can make a claim about that until a person is like a, a, an adult enough person to be a person and have ideas about that. Right. Um, and I don't necessarily say that that's psychology either, because to me, psychology also implies something a little bit innate. And maybe that's just my misunderstanding of, of the term psychology. But I think, you know, gender is very much comes from like a, an interaction with the culture and an understanding of, of yourself um, and how you feel that you fit into a given cultural context. Right. That makes sense. Uh, hmm. But psychology to me is also a dangerous term when we talk about gender, especially gender diversity, because, you know, there's a long and storied history of, of psychologists defining anything outside of the norm as being an actual disorder. I mean, Correct. It, it was extremely recently that being gay at all was not defined as an What act. was the term? There was a term for it. There was like a psychological, clinical, like term for being gay uh i it depended on whether you were a male who was gay or right, a female who was gay because um a female who was gay had what was it uh not uh les lesbos it's sappho sappho right you were like had uh sapphic tendencies nice and Which you kind of would to be, be able to keep that I mean, I'm about that life, but like you would be lobotomized for it. So, yeah. I mean, you'd mostly be lobotomized for being a woman who thought too much back in back in the day. So, oh my God, you had emotions. You spoke back to your husband. Lobotomy. <laughs> or what was the other treatment for it? The other treatment was they masturbated you. What was that? Oh, oh that yeah, the lobotomy. Those were the good days, right? Those were the good days. <laughs> Those kidding. that was uh, because you had. Uh, quote unquote wandering uterus. Wandering or, uterus is my hysteria. Yeah. Or hysteria. Or hysteria. hysteria. Yeah. I love it. Like the treatment of her hysteria is well, freaking masturbation. Well, it, it wasn't even masturbation. It was actually like. Or electrocution. <laughs> yeah. Like electrocution, uh, lobotomy, or. <laughs> All uh, things that you love. Maybe not lobotomy, but. <laughs> I mean, I do love my, I do love myself some electricity. Um, but uh, like stimulating the clitoris, which was also really interesting because that's how the first vibrator was invented. Of course. And. It's a cure for hysteria. I know, but like it's, it, it is not lost on me that the Hitachi magic wand looks distinctly similar to the very first vibrator. I mean, they and got it when right. you got it right, when you got it right, you got it right. <laughs> and like Hitachi was like, uh, this is a back massager. And everyone was like, sure, Jan. Sure. I mean, I oh suspect all the people that like got to go to their doctors and be like, I am hysterical and then get like a free Oh yeah, well that that became like a thing where like women like would like check themselves in and be like I'm hysterical because like their doctor was like doing it better than their husband. Right, their doctor was the only one getting I don't them think off. Was doing it, you know. Right, their husband wasn't doing anything at all. Their husband was just like I'm gonna like use you as a fuck doll, and then they'd when be like, ah, even this find the, the worst for the first time. When did anyone even read that term? I don't know. The oh term. well, I mean, even in like modern day society, we still don't know a whole lot about the. Clitoris. like we just found out like within the last like 10 years that the clitoris is like a huge fucking organ and like is like the outside presentation of it is like the tiniest part of it and like the clitoris tip actually, of the iceberg right so like the g-spot is actually part of the clitoris oh, wow. on the inside and like yeah, it's a whole like an fucking alien. thing it sort of branches up yeah we're gonna have to show visualizations of this because it like literally the you way of the clitoris very surprised 
Yeah, the, huh. the way the clitoris works. So like on the outside, it's just like this tiny little like nub. But on the inside, it literally like looks like this um, going over the top of like the top wall of the vagina. So like it's just like this big, huge, like branching thing. And so you can stimulate the top of it from the inside, which is why some women actually really enjoy internal stimulation um, because it's rubbing against their clitoris, but it's also like a lot of women prefer external stimulation because the like tiny little knob or whatever on the outside has a lot more nerve endings. Right. So external stimulation tends to be more pleasurable than internal stimulation, but like that internal stimulation is still stimulating the clitoris. That's so interesting. So it's part of the same organ. Yes. Oh yeah. It's, it's wow. wild. Welcome to sex education. Wow. We should do a whole episode. How to find the clit with Vivica. Honestly, I would absolutely do an entire, I would do an entire episode about the clitoris and like how I need to to be there in person for that. I feel like I want to just surround John and be like, so listen, (laughs) like that me with all the strings. (laughs) <laughs> so it's like okay so over here you've got this and like over here you've got that no absolutely because like there's so many different ways that like there's so many different types of orgasms and that's one of the things that like even now in like our current understanding of uh modern medicine we still don't like really know everything there is to know about the female orgasm. Like we are just now understanding that there are at least four different types of orgasms that you can have. So you can have an external um, stimulation orgasm. You can have an internal stimulation orgasm. You can have a G spot orgasm or you can have an anal orgasm. And all of those different things are. Women can have anal orgasms. Absolutely. Women can have anal orgasms. That's a total thing. Like, I mean, men can obviously have prostate orgasms and that's like a, like literally hitting the male G spot. And like that orgasm is clutch but like there are at least four different types of female uh bodied orgasms that we currently know of but like two of them are literally hitting because they're hitting the same organ why did god give us all of these ways of orgasm you, john. orgasming if, if we aren't supposed to Fuck play with you them? john i'm not even gonna let you finish that stupid <laughs> statement <laughs> i mean hey it's it's kind of a gotcha for religion. Like, how do they explain that? Uh, well, first yeah. of all, religion doesn't think that. They okay, think so the devil put the put the clitoris there, John. That's the why. Right, dev- which is oh the devil, I right? Which devil. is also why you have the a whole. Cool. Mm, I mean, he like honestly, he and I would get along. Like, is he <laughs> single? Like, where's he at though? Um, but like, that's also how you have a lot of cultures that engage in uh female genital mutilation right because they think that like a woman having sexual pleasure is evil Haram. in some sort of capacity <laughs> because technically only men are supposed to be able to have pleasure from sex and that's stupid and <laughs> again like we talked about diversity of opinion Right. When, when it comes to making these no decisions, women in the room. if women were in the room being involved in that decision making process, like, uh, that shit would never fly. So that's me. why diversity is so important. Yeah, I was going to say, circling back to weirdly to what we were talking about earlier, like part of the reason we don't know much about female sexuality, female genitalia, all of that is that there is not a lot of funding to be had to study like female predominant issues. Like even right. Right. in my personal experience, I know of people trying to get, you know, funding to study um bulimia anorexia and these are there are they're not female specific but they're female predominant problems and there's just a lot less funding for that than other diseases and you know i don't know maybe there's less funding for male specific diseases too i somehow doubt it i doubt that because i mean mean, we have viagra on the fucking market like literally like a couple guys were like i can't get my dick hard and we immediately had a pill for it so like (laughs) I feel like the funding for uh, male specific issues goes through very fucking quickly and happens almost instantaneously. And like, well, because generally speaking over the, over history, it's been men reviewing the funding for these kinds of things and and basically approving or denying it. And you look at Congress even. And it's not that simple anymore, right? Like women perpetuate sexism. A lot of things. Amy Coney Barrett. Well, right. For sure. Interesting. Yeah. So. Because women can perpetuate misogyny too. 
Hmm. But at the end of the day, when you increase diversity of within the the, the population of people who are making decisions, you, you bring you know perspectives to the table that wouldn't have been there otherwise, and that's that's what's so important. Right. Well, you yeah, you start bringing enough loud people like Alicia and me, and then eventually, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. No things. So basically, end. put Olivia and I on any board. Hooray! Get to it, ladies. People's. Honestly, I think that is a perfect place to end unless there was something else. No, this is this has been so phenomenal. I uh, thank you so much for taking the time, Olivia. It's it's been a long time coming. Um, You've been watching us put this this little project together over the over the past few months. And, you know, we've talked to you quite a bit about these kinds of things. And it's so fun to get you here on the podcast, on video, on Zoom with Earth in the background. We're still in the middle of a a pandemic, but. (laughs) No, I mean, these these are the kinds of issues we need to be talking about. We need to be elevating. We need to be finding ways to, you know, expose people to this kind of thinking and 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 just, you know, advancing the conversation so that more people are are, are thinking about these kinds of issues and understanding them so that we can move forward as a society. And, and it's people like you who are doing the actual work, doing the research in there on the ground level that that can share a perspective that that we need to hear more of. So we really, really appreciate you taking the time. Well, uh, people like me don't really mean a lot without people like you actually spreading the word around to people who listen to you because people don't tend to talk to scientists and we're not very good at talking to people. So thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. And obviously, you're going to be our go to scientist whenever we have questions that are science related, even if it's not in your field, deal with it. We're going to be calling you and be like, so Dr. Gray, we need to talk about a very (laughs) particular topic. Uh, perfect. Then I'll learn other things and I'll get out of my fucking tiny bubble. That's the perfect. Love it. And you're gonna come back to New York and do it in person. Yeah, that's that's a must. We're gonna force you to. If we have to buy you a ticket, we'll get you in. No, you're bitch. moving here. I'm obviously moving there the second I get. Yes, exactly. Good. We look let, forward to it. Let her finish her PhD. We're first. gonna let her finish. <laughs> this motherfucker. <laughs> so but then we're kidnapping her. <laughs> I will accept this. Cool. Well, we look forward to that. Absolutely. Um, so thank you again. And we look forward to talking to you in the next one. Uh, if anybody's interested in checking out your research, your work, do you have anything online that's that's worth I, taking a look at? I don't right now, but I will absolutely right. do what I do and you can put it out there. Cool. Sounds good. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Liv. Thanks for checking out this clip from our show. To watch more clips or full episodes, click on our profile below. If you want to stay up to date on all of our new episodes and videos, click subscribe. And if you have any ideas for future guests or topics that you would like to see us cover on the show, leave us a message in the comments or connect with us on any of our social media channels at Funtime Program or on our website at FuntimeProgram.com. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.